Hey, welcome to my channel and thanks for stopping by. This is going to be my intermediate bug bounty hunting course. So it's gonna be very focused on web application testing. Some of what we're gonna talk about is going to relate off of the first bug bounty course that I have made. So if you have not watched that or check that out, you can. It is the first link in the description. So with that out of the way, a few things I wanna let you know. I'm not going to be holding your hand quite as much through a lot of these exploits. I'm expecting you to have some foundational knowledge and to understand the basics of testing web applications and understanding how to use Burp. And I'm assuming you have a box already set up. If you do not understand a lot of these concepts, then you should go back and watch my first bug bounty course. So if you dive straight into this course, it might be over your head just a little bit. If not, you can sure give it a try and then just Google what you don't understand. I'm hoping that it is really clear. I tried to keep it as short as possible with the most amount of useful information. But with that said, the lab that I wanted to use for a lot of the advanced attacks and a lot of the header attacks is actually not working right now. And I've been waiting for the past few days for it to get fixed. It is still down. So I decided to just go ahead and put this course out now. And if that gets fixed or when it gets fixed, I will add in that advanced portion of the course. These courses take a lot of time and a lot of effort for me to put together. So if you enjoy this course, please do leave a like. And if you want more content like this in the future, then you can let me know down in the comments below. And if you would like to subscribe, you can do that as well. Now let's jump into it. We're gonna cover server-side request to forgery. The purpose of this video is to show you what is going on inside of server-side request forgery and walk through a couple of examples so maybe you can understand what is happening. So the way we're gonna go about this is I'm gonna show you a flowchart and the flowchart might not make a whole lot of sense in the beginning, but I wanna show it to you so that way you kinda of see what is happening. And then we're gonna walk through two different examples and then come back to the flowchart. And at that point, the server-side request forgery should make a lot of sense to you. And you should be able to start looking for these bugs as you are browsing through programs and you'll be able to submit a proof of concept that makes sense to the person who receives your bug report with that let's jump into it or with a very simple basic flowchart I tried to make it as simple as possible so that you guys could understand exactly what's going on and that it wouldn't be too busy with too much going on so this would be us the user and you can also change this to the hacker or the attacker and so the attacker sends a URL request to the website so we're manipulating the URL and then the website makes this request that you weren't supposed to be able to make to the server and then the server sends the data back to the website and then you can view it as the attacker. So this is how the flow works. If you were just a regular user, we would just have user here and you'd send a request and it's just as any request that's going to the website and the website would pull the information from the server and the, the data would be sent back to the website and you would see the request that the website made to the server. The problem with a server-side request forgery comes in when you have the ability to manipulate this URL request. So let's say it's the URL wants to reach back to the home or root directory and you're able to grab a file off of the server instead of the actual directory right here. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and move into an example. So we are going to be using this example from Love on Hack the Box. I'm not gonna walk through all of the recon and what gets you to this point, but rather just what is going on with the URL. So in here, we have the web application that's gonna reach out to the server through this URL form right here. And if you're ever doing a CTF or any kind of certification and you see something like this, this is a dead giveaway that there is a server-side request forgery anytime you see a URL right here but most of the time the URL is going to look like this up here and you're going to have something like this and then it will pass in a parameter like a URL equals and then it'll have a file right here such as the root directory or some kind of file so we could just put in here some file and then what you would do is you would manipulate this right here and you could pull down files a different way but instead of having it right here inside of the URL this web application has it right here and because this is an easy box on hack the box that's probably the reason they put the URL request down here in a submit format instead of being in the URL and you have to deal with it inside of burp so this is how you're normally gonna see it it'll be up here in the URL something like this and in the next example we're gonna see it's also not gonna be up here but it's gonna submit a URL request and we'll be able to see it in burp and we'll be able to manipulate it just like we would up here only we're gonna do it in burp 
So inside of this file scanner right here on this hack the box, if you ever want to test a server side request forgery, it's pretty simple. You can just come over here to a terminal and you can set up a netcat listener on port 80 and it needs to be on port 80 because it's going to have to go through the HTTP protocol over here. You would just type in something like HTTP right here. This is my VPN with hack the box and so we can hit scan file it's going to hang for a second we can cancel it or you can just come over here and cancel out of this you can see that it reached out to my little netcat listener here on port 80 and so we know that this is trying to grab a url and you can check to see if it's grabbing a file from the server by typing in the actual ip address so in this case for this hack the box the ip address is http slash slash and it's 10 10 10 239 just like this and if we scan this it's actually going to bring back the web page right here so if we went to this ip address right here we said http and then we said 10 10 10 239 and then we come here you'll see this voting system right here this is also on this server so i actually had to add this to the etsy host file and if you're not familiar with that what that is that's okay so because we're able to pull down this voting system by pointing this machine to itself we know that we are able to pull information from the server and i want to show you why this is so bad and it's such a detrimental vulnerability because if i were to come in here and we scanned and we searched through all these files like you would in order to get remote code execution on this box. You can grab files off of this server. And in the case of this specific box on Hack the Box, you're able to grab a password file. So you would have to go through and scan the network. But just to show you, we're not going to do that. We can grab. So this is the local host and it's on port 5000 and we can hit scan file i was missing this dot here we can hit scan file and it's going to pull this information from the server and it's going to tell us that you have the credentials for admin right here so this would probably be the admin and then then you have the password right here so this is why server side request forgery is so bad is you can pull information that you shouldn't be able to access from the file so we're going to move on to a port swigger right here and they have a basic ssrf against a local server it's going to tell us to solve this lab we're going to change the url access of the admin interface at this location and we're going to delete this user right here so let's open up the lab and the way we're going to go about solving this is i forgot where it told us this is located i think it said inside of a check the stock feature so if you come over here and we open up burp we can turn actually we need to be inside here now we can turn intercept on and we can check the stock and we'll send this to repeater and then we can just turn this off okay before we change any of this we're going to send this to repeater so you can see what we get back this is the normal request this is what we get back we get back a response of okay but if we just delete this whole thing right here and we paste in the local host and then we go to the admin and we send this we're going to get back a different page and we're actually told that we've reached the basic SRS SSRF against the local server. And I think we're supposed to actually delete the user Carlos right here. And so the way we would go about doing this, actually, before we delete him, I want to try something just because I just showed it. We can go 127.0.0.1 and this should send us to the local host as well. See if we get back the same thing and we did. So this is what we would do is you can type in localhost right here or 127.0.0.1 and then we're on the admin page. Now what we need to do is delete the user Carlos and I'm guessing this is supposed to be done from the admin panel. I suppose you could read through here and maybe it might tell us what we can do from the admin panel. Oh, it tells us right here. It says we need to delete the user Carlos. So you could actually just copy this right here. Look, it says we can delete these users. It actually tells us we can delete a bunch of users and we can paste this in here. Um, we got too many admins going on. We can delete that all the way back. Now, if we hit delete, 
this right here should pop up to solved. So if we send this, it tells us not found. I think we have to follow the redirect. Turn the proxy off. And it tells us that we have deleted the user Carlos. So this is how a server side request forgery works. And I want to walk you through this one more time. So now I want to bring you back to this flow chart right here. And now you understand that what we're doing when we, we are the user and we make a request through the URL through something like this. And let's say we want to get a file. You would do this right here. And if you were on a Linux machine, it would look something like this and you could try and pull down the etsy passwd file actually i'm not sure if there's supposed to be a colon there or not so you can google and check that i can't remember but it would be something like this to pull down the etsy passwd file and on windows you're going to be trying to pull down some kind of windows system file that would just be on the server to see if you can get files but you wouldn't do this necessarily in a proof of concept what you're going to do is like i showed over here with opening up a netcat listener and then making a request to the url which is going to be your own ip address right here to see if you get a connection back a quick tip to see if you're trying to figure out what the server is if it's linux or windows and you want to know what kind of file to look for you can actually just ping the server and see the hack the box is a windows server and it's 239 whenever you see this TTL of a 127 or a 128 or something in the 120s it's going to be a Windows server and when you ping a Linux server it's going to be somewhere in like the 65 range and that's one way to tell what kind of server you're going up against you can just really simply ping it or you can run an in map scan and it will tell you but this is server side request forgery in a nutshell you're going to make a you're the user and you make a request through the URL to the website and then the website requests the URL from the server and the server sends the data back to the website and then you're able to view it as the user and if you are able to manipulate the URL request to the server you can grab files from the server that you shouldn't be able to access. Okay, so before we move on from server-side request forgery, I really wanted to show you one more thing that you might come up against in the future. So we're here on Forge from Hack the Box, and you have this upload from URL, and I'm not entirely sure how it's going out and grabbing the URL or an image from the URL, because this is apparently a gallery website, and you can post images to the website. So we can ha we have upload an image, you can upload through the browse like, like this, or you can upload from a URL, so I imagine it's doing some kind of wget or something like that. And we know that we are on a Linux box, so you can try and do some stuff here. We'll just ping it real quick. So if we ping the IP address, you can see the TTL is 63. So that tells us we are on a Linux box. And so if you wanted to, you could do something like a file slash slash and then we would go etsy pass wd and we can try and pull this down and it tells us that we're not allowed to do this so we're on a linux box we're not allowed to grab files directly from the server this way so i'm going to put this in burp and we'll play with it in there so we can and we know that the url is working because if we come out here and we set out and we set up our netcat listener like we have been doing and we put in our IP address, which I have up here, which is 10, 10, 14, 6, just like this. And we hit that, it's hanging, and we see it reach out to our box right here. We can close out of that. So we know the URL is working. Now we just need to figure out how to get the SSRF to work. So we can come back over here. We'll put this in burp and then we'll play with it. So we'll just put in some, we'll just put in our own IP address right here. We'll turn intercept on and we'll submit this. We can send this to repeater. We can turn that off and it's going to give an error because it's, there's nothing for it to connect to, but that is okay. So over here in repeater, we have this right here. And if you remember to on URL encode, it is control shift U. If you are on a Mac, not sure what it is if you are on a Windows box. So 
there's a couple of different ways to get this SSRF to work. And I actually want to try something real quick that I have not tried on this box before. I want to see if the if we can bypass the filter by going file slash slash Etsy pass WD. And I believe this actually needs three right here to work. And so what you see we did here is we saw that it didn't work with just Etsy password, but it might just have a filter on the box. And if we change some of the casing, it may work for us. And it tells us we have an invalid protocol, so it has to be an HTTP or an HTTP request. So we're not able to just pull down a file because it's requiring HTTP in order to be in the request. We're not going to try and grab the Etsy Pass WD file. So what we're going to do now is just try and make a request back to the server and get it to work. So in a bug bounty world, if you come across something like this, and you're just trying to prove that you can reach back to the server with a request what we're going to do is just try and query the server and see if we can get this to tell us something other than an invalid protocol so if we come in here and we go to the actual url which we have right here which would be forge.htb and we send this we get told it is blacklisted so you're not able to go to the actual url right here but if you do like we tried with the file pass with the etsy pass wd file you can just come in here and type in forge and you can just change a few of these characters and now if you send it it tells us we have reached back to the server and we are not getting a blacklisted message any longer so this is one way to try and bypass like a blacklist or something on a server and if you come in here and you do a 127.0.0.1 and you send this like we were doing earlier it is blacklisted but the actual ip address so if you wanted to get the ip address of this right here it tells us that this right here is blacklisted but if we actually wanted to get the ip address let's say we're on like yahoo or something and we want to know the actual ip address of what we have going on right here uh, burp will actually tell us what the ip address is really easy you can just come over to your proxy and turn your proxy on and for that and we can come to our url upload you can just type something in here doesn't matter what it is submit it and when you hit this it'll tell us like the request is being sent to forge.htb but the ip address is 10 10 11 111 and we don't really need that request so what you can do since this is blacklisted and this is blacklisted you can just try the actual ip address to the server and in this case it looks like this and you can send it and you can see that it went through. So the IP address, ironically, is not blacklisted. I'm not sure if Hack the Box meant for that to work or not, but it worked. So you can actually try several different ways to get past the blacklist within a server-side request forgery. And this is a few different ways to do that. Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and pause on SSRF at this point. If you have any questions on server-side request forgery and you'd like to see something in more detail, please let me know down in the comments. But in the world of bug bounty, this would be plenty to get you by. However, if you're going to be a penetration tester, you're probably going to have to dive into SSRF in a little deeper context. That way you learn how to take a server-side request forgery and turn it into remote code execution. But but I think that is out of scope of this video. So we're going to go ahead and pause this here. And if you would like to see more server-side request forgery in the future and how to turn this into remote code execution, please let me know and I'll get to that. All right, before we close out this section here on the server-side request forgery, I thought I would pull up the activity and I was reading through some of these recently. And you can just see, look at how high the impact is for server-side request forgery. And I was reading through how some of these were done. And this one right here was really cool. And I thought I would show you how this actually works. And I and so I went and read through this and I actually did learn a little bit about the exploit and it was pretty cool. And I came back to the Port Swigger Labs and was playing around and I found out something I did not know before. So if you come in here where this server-side request forgery is and you remember it's right here inside this stock api 
we can send this over to repeater and if we do the unurl encode it we have this right here and we can see what's being sent but we'll go ahead and put that back but what you can do that I didn't realize we were able to do is you can just add in another parameter. If we were like breaking this right here and it wasn't working, we can just come, come in here, put the and sign and type in stock API equals. And then we could just do the local host. And then we can go slash admin because we're supposed to pull down the slash admin panel. And we can send that and we need HTTP slash slash and it works for us and it pulls down the information we needed in order to delete the user Carlos so I didn't know beforehand that we can just add in new parameters right here and so I thought this was something that was really cool that you can add in extra parameters in here uh, in addition to the one that's already there so you don't actually have to delete this first one you can just pull down a pull down a second one and then also reading through the hacktivity I noticed I think what we'll do is just delete this first one so that way it looks nicer so you can see it and so we'll send this and we don't get quite as big of a page back when you're doing something like searching for an SSRF I noticed a few of the hacktivities were they had hit a, a line like this that's accepting in a parameter or even up here in the URL. And what they just started doing was they would say and URL equals and then they had put in 127.1 and then and then you could just leave it like that. And they were sending this and it would be easier to test for this if you had it in repeater so we can grab this send it to repeater not sequencer send this over turn that off and then if you send this you'll see it doesn't actually pull anything back for us and you can search for the word delete over here as if we were going to delete the user and there is nothing but you could search you can but you can try this url you can try url s and send that to see if this is a parameter that will actually reach out to the server. Usually it's going to be saved as a URLS or a URL, something like this. And this is not vulnerable. This actual lab is not vulnerable with the URL parameter because the URL parameter is not the one that's making the request out to the server. But you could very easily change this with a change request message change the request method and then delete this and just add in the stock a api just like this and this should work i think we have to make it so it says it needs to go to the admin panel uh it needed this up here at products and then in the stock directory and then and i forgot http slash slash so basically this is just remaking this request over here but this should work now and it does. So you can play around with these when you're in a live program and see if you can find a parameter that actually does hit the URL. So if you come over here and you open up this and you're reading through it, what's really interesting inside of this guy's explanation is there was actually a notification that says this right here is reaching out to the URL parameter which just pretty much tells you that it's going to be vulnerable to a server side request forgery. And when he tested it right here, it works. Now this guy had to do a little more to it and I don't want to read all this to you. So you can come out here and read it, but he had to do a little bit more in order to get this to work through a token. I believe it was, but it was a pretty cool server side request forgery. And you can come over to the hacktivity now that you understand how server side request forgery works and you can read through some of these and see if you can learn additional ways to pull off server side request forgery. So with that, I'll see you in the next vulnerability. All right, welcome to the section on command injection. This is probably gonna be one of the most severe vulnerabilities that you will ever come across. This vulnerability gives you the opportunity to execute commands on the server and get information back and possibly even get a shell on the server. So this is one of the most severe vulnerabilities that you will probably come across.
because you can just compromise the server and all of the information on it. And if you're in a penetration test, then you can try and move around within the network. So let's go ahead and dive into command injection. Okay, we are going to be talking a little bit about command injection. And there's not really a whole lot of places to practice command injection that I know of. Really, it's just try hack me and then port swigger, which we'll come to here in a little bit in practice on. So with command injection, what we are able to do is put commands into the server and then it tell us back, it'll give us the information back for whatever we sent the command in for. So if we send a who am I command, it will tell us who we're running as on the server. And so it says here, a command injection vulnerability is also known as remote code execution because an attacker can trick the application into executing a series of payloads, payloads that they provide without direct access to the machine. So this might sound a little confusing, but it's going to make a lot of sense here in just a second. And so their example here is the who am I command. And I'm going to go ahead and launch this box. And then once it is loaded, I will bring you back. Okay, so this is now loaded up and ready for us to practice some command injection. But before we do, I want to show you kind of what is happening. If we come over to a terminal here, and the first thing I want to do is copy this to make sure we know what kind of commands to send through to the server. But really, you could just put in an I, uh, who am I, and you could probably figure it out by that. But we can also type in ping and then the IP address that we just copied. And then you can hit enter and we see that the TTL is 61. So we know that this is going to be a Linux server that we are up against. So now it tells us to use this handy web application to test the availability of a device by entering its IP address. And it's just going to go out and reach to an IP address. So a way to test this is to see if we wanted to check our device. We could come over here and set this up. And my IP address is up here. So we could say 10 to 42.96 and execute and see if we can get it to reach out and it sent a ping out to our box and it did not connect but it pinged our box so this is just sending a ping it's not actually trying to connect so what we can do with this now is you can just type in 127.0.1 and you can execute it and it's going to tell us it's going to give us back another ping of the box and i guess i didn't need to ping it because it tells us right here it's going to be a Linux box. So some of the things we can do, I actually played around with this. That's why you can see these in here. I wanted to see all the different commands that it actually let me send. So I wasn't just sitting here testing everything for the first time. So here's a couple of the command injections that you're going to need to know. If you come in here and we type in 127.0.1, you can do an and sign like this, um, 0.0.0.1. We can put in an and sign just like this, and then we can do a who am I, and it'll execute. And you can see that it says we are WW data, but we still get this ping right here. And it is possible in the coming lessons that we're gonna, we just don't wanna see all of this ping right here. So what you can actually do is just put in a bunch of mumbo jumbo, and then you can use a double pipe and do the who, who and then do the who am I, and it skips the ping and we get the WW data. But if we run this command right here and we don't double pipe it, you only do one pipe. Oh, it still works. Okay, I was gonna say that it doesn't work, but it worked for us. So we still get the, w, the WWW data. So sometimes it won't work with one pipe and you'll want to send through two pipes. And then sometimes you'll also have to have like a pipe afterwards and run it and that time it doesn't work for us. So you will in the wild just have to play around with this. So we get the who am I and it tells us we're WWW data and you can type in ID and see how we're com we're sending commands through. So if we come back over here and I type in ID, you can see we get this back. So we're actually communicating with the server and this would be a very, very bad thing in the real world. So there's one more thing I wanted to show you and that is this ping right here. If you were doing a blind command injection and you weren't, and you wanted to know if you could reach the server but you weren't getting any information back, you could run the 
regular whatever is up here sometimes it's not it's not going to be something like this you're not going to be pinging a server it'll usually be a parameter with an equal sign and then you'll put a command in over here but you can ping and the dash c with the 10 is going to tell it to delay 10 seconds so we'll actually put in five seconds so we don't have to wait quite so long and it's going to ping itself so if you watch down here we have the seconds and we'll hit it when it hits 10 seconds and wait for it and see if it comes back in five seconds. If so, then that works, and it did. So we pinged it, and that's how you do a time delay, which we're gonna see in just a little bit. You can also run these with this and sign right here. There will be times that you'll need to try this, and you can actually, if you're getting stuck on command injection, what you can do is go out to Google and just type in command injection bypass and just look for different windows command injection bypass maybe you'll have to do some url encoding or something of that nature and you can just bypass whatever filters they have so you can also do with this you can do two two and signs just like this and it should still work for us and we'll send that over and see if it takes five seconds and it comes back and then I want to try one more thing. I actually have not tried this yet, but because this didn't reach back on our netcat, I want to try this again. We'll set up a netcat listener and we're gonna set it up on port 4000 and see if we can actually get this to connect back to us. So if we do this right here, we can do our pipe. We'll actually do a double pipe and then hopefully we have netcat available and we can type in our IP address for it to connect back to. So 10 to 42.96 and then dash E and then we'll go Ben bash and then we can execute this and see if it reaches back. It doesn't look like it's going to because I did not type in the port. So we'll highlight this We need to put a port in here, and I think I did 4,000, execute, it was port 4,000, and it did not reach out, so maybe this doesn't work. We'll try one more time, and then we'll move on, and I want to show you one other thing you can try with this. So netcat doesn't work didn't reach out to us. So one thing you can also do in this command injection, like if you were gonna capture the flag, one thing I would do is I would come in here and I would type which Python and see if we could get a Python reverse shell. And we can close out of that. And let's do something like this so we can get just what we want back. and we don't have any output, let's see. So this this box might not let us get a reverse shell on it. So I guess we're not gonna be able to figure out what kind of Python's on here, but this would be command injection in a nutshell. And I'm guessing we just, oh, we have Python 3. So we could try to get a reverse shell with Python. So you could come to Google and we would type in Python reverse shell. We can try a pen test monkey. And we could try this right here. So we can set up our netcat listener. We'll go port 444. And we can type something in here. We got bin, I want bin bash. What do we have over here? And it's possible that this won't work either. And I would suggest typing something out like this in a text editor, save some time. Point 96, and make sure this says we need Python three, execute. And we get a shell back over here. So now if we say, who am I? We are on the box. And if we type in ID, it'll tell us who we are. So you can get a reverse shell this way.
rather than just be sitting over here with command injection. And sorry, I kind of fumbled around there. I actually didn't try that before we did this little video here. So this is command injection. In a nutshell, this is a great place to practice. So if you have a subscription to try Hack Me, this is a really good place to come over here and practice your command injection. But if you don't, there's also a free way to practice command injection. And we're gonna practice it here in just a second on Port Swigger. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna get things set up and we will start command injection over here in port swigger if you would like to go ahead and open up port swigger and get this set up so you can follow along or try them on your own then you can do that okay so here we are at port swigger and we are on the os command injection we're going to do these first three right here because they're pretty easy and i believe you had to have burp pro for this and so we're not going to do these ones down here but the first three of these are actually pretty easy and you should be able to i think solve them i think you probably could solve all three on your own uh, but for sure you should be able to solve these first two so we'll go ahead and open this up and it tells us this lab contains an os command injection vulnerability in the product id checker the application executes the shell containing the user supplied product store ID. So we've seen stuff like this in the past. So we'll access this lab and it tells us we are not solved because we haven't done anything. So when we have finished this, this should say solved up here. So we can see what burp is doing. It's doing nothing. It's not hooked up. So down here in the check stock, like we've been doing and following the instructions right here in the product stock checker, we can forward that. We're going to check stock forward and right here is what we need. Send that to repeater. We can turn that off. And now we have the product ID and the store ID. And this is going to be where the command injection is at. So if you would like to try and solve this command injection by yourself, I would go ahead and give you this challenge. We have found the location and I think you can figure it out. It's right here you should try and see if you can figure out some of the command injection commands that you just saw previously and give it a shot. But if not, here we go. So we have this product ID right here of one. And what we were doing in some of the last ones was we were able to put this and sign in here, but because of the location of the command injection in this post request, we're not gonna be able to use those. We will have to use a pipe. And so you can type in a pipe right here and do something like a who am I? And we can send this and see what happens and it tells us who we are. So that's probably right there solved this for us and it did. But while we're here, let's play around with this. Let's see what happens if we do two pipes and we send this, uh, it does nothing. What happens if we do two pipes at the end and send it, nothing comes back. What happens if we just do one and one and this is just something that I would encourage you to do as you find across, you come across things like this. So we actually have it come back with a pipe at the end in the beginning. What happens if we change this to cl very clearly a product ID we don't have and it still works? What happens if the product ID is wrong and we have two pipes and we send it? Nothing. Now, what about this store ID right here? What if we try two pipes and we go, who am I? It gives us a syntax error. What about two pipes? And we send it. It gives us the same thing. We can come over here and maybe we can say an ID. It tells us who we are. And so you can really just play around with this and see what happens. What if we put a crazy ID number in here. It still works. And then you can just mess around with this and see what works and what doesn't. If we check a who am I syntax error, we could go which Python like we did before. And this is black because it needs to be URL encoded, which is a plus sign. And we don't get anything back. And I don't think that you're able to get remote code execution on this. So here we go. This would be your command injection right here. We're going to try and do another one on this 
on this lab right here. So if you would like to go ahead and open this up and read the instructions, then I would say go ahead and see if you can figure this out. Um, I'm not going to read it just yet. I want you to go ahead and read this and try and figure it out on your own. And if you get stuck, then we'll go over it. Okay, so this says the lab contains a blind OS injection. So if you're familiar with the bug bounty for beginners course that I already have out, then we know that a blind injection means we're going to have to do some kind of time delay and it's not going to tell us what's in the response. So we have a 10 second delay in order to solve this challenge and it tells us that the vulnerability is in the feedback function. So with this, you can go ahead and open up the lab. And we have this submit feedback right here. And we can just type in a bunch of gibberish. And I think this is going to ask for some kind of ending for an email account. And we can come back and intercept this. Send it. We'll send this to a repeater. And it is possible that this took you much, much longer to figure out because we have a bunch of different parameters in here that we are testing against. So we have the name right here. So in a time delay, we saw this in the uh, try hack me example that I, I showed you. You're going to try and do a ping against the server itself and wait for the time delay. So what we would do in a time delay command injection or a blind command injection with a time delay, you will type in ping and then we have to URL encode it and it will look just like we did previously. I'm going to do five seconds to start out so we don't have to wait 27.0.0.1. And then if we send this, we'll see right here, this should be like four or 5,000 when it actually works. So we can try a pipe at the beginning, pipe at the end. We can try another pipe. And I see that I made a mistake. I didn't have the one in there. So we'll try this again and say, go, still not long enough. We can add in another one and see if this works. And it doesn't seem like this is going to be our spot. Otherwise, one of these would work. We can't use the and sign in there. So we'll just move on to the next one. We'll say pipe, ping. And I have this, I fast forwarded typing this in so you didn't have to watch it again. So we got our pipe and our ping command. We can send this, we'll turn this proxy off. It's bothering me that it's flashing. We can see that the time did not work. So we can throw a pipe on the end, send it, not long enough. Let's try two pipes and we can send it. And our time is much longer and we can see that it was almost five seconds. So now to solve this, I believe we can type in a 10 right here and send it. And this should give us the solve because the five seconds was pretty close so it's not solved and it just came back and it tells us that it has solved so this is a timed command injection or a blind command injection this is how you would test it with a ping against the server itself and give it a time delay so with that we're going to move into the last one of our command injection labs. This one is going to be a lot harder. I think you can figure it out if you've done the my bug bounty course and you've also gone through my free ethical hacking course because the ethical hacking course is gonna cover things that are kind of like this when you get into the actual penetration testing portion of that course. So if you've gone through both of those, I think you can solve this. If not, and you're pretty new, you're probably going to struggle with this one, but we'll go ahead and solve it anyway. So we'll open up the lab in a new window and then we'll read what it says. So it has a vulnerability that is blind in the feedback function, just like we had before. The output is not returned in the response like before. However, you can use the output redirect to capture the output from the command. And it says that we have a writable folder. 
And then it tells us that to solve the lab, we need to execute a who am I command and retrieve the output. So what we're going to end up having to do is send a who am I command to the server. And then we're going to have to save it in a file inside of this images directory. So it's going to be var www images and then the file with an output. So if you went through the ethical hacking course, I think you can solve this. If not, uh, we'll go ahead and solve it together now. So I just had an idea. If you want to try this on your own, um, I can actually show you over here. We can make a directory and we'll call it test. We'll CD into test, CD to test. And then what we can do is if I type in who am I, I can send this command and I can put it in a file.txt. And now if I hit enter and then we cat will ls, you can see this files here and I cat out file.txt. It tells us that we are Kali or if I g-edit g this file, it'll save the response in there. So we're basically going to be doing this right here inside of this directory right here. So what we're going to do is give a who am I like, like we did up here, only it's going to be in this right here and so your command is going to look like this and if it has to be url encoded you'll need plus signs right here um, if not you can just you might be able just to delete this and do it with no space and then you're going to need to try and retrieve the file with the command injection and i want to see if you can figure this out so go ahead and give it a try now that i have given you a hint with this clue right here okay so let's go ahead and solve this challenge. It said it was in the feedback. So we'll come back to the proxy. We can come to submit feedback. We'll do the same thing we did before and just type in some mumbo jumbo at gmail.com and turn our proxy on submit feedback, send this to repeater, turn the pro turn the proxy off. And so here we are at the same page we were at. I'm actually going to make sure that this is in the exact same, the command injection is in the exact same place. So we don't spend a bunch of time trying to send this somewhere that it's not. So we'll go ping. So I wrote the ping command out so you didn't have to watch it. I sent it and we'll see it was a five second delay. So the command is, the command injection is in the same place. So we should be able to come in here and say, who am I? And then we'll give our carrot and then we'll give it the location that we were supposed to give it right here. Paste that in and then we'll say file.txt and send this and hope that it worked. And now I think the way to check this is going to be we'll need I think it'll be file and then we'll want to read this file dot txt so we'll send this okay since this right here isn't working we're going to just go ahead and assume this is not going to be in the right directory so what we can do with this right here is we know we had to send it into the var www and then i think it was images and then it was our output.txt which is where we and then it was our file.txt which is where we put our command who am i right that's what it says we do yes it's in the images so what we're gonna probably have to do at this point is find the images because we're not able to pull anything from here so what we'll do is go to the home page and see if we can pull an image somewhere around here see we have the products we have the product ID we have the image okay so we right click the image and hit open image in new tab and we have the image and now we have a file name 
I bet we can do this without burp. And then if we can't, we'll open it up in burp. So we'll type in file.txt, which is where we put the file and it tells us who we are as the user. So that's one way to solve this challenge. It was a lot more, this one was a lot more difficult of a command injection. In the real world, you wouldn't do anything like this. The only time you're gonna do something like this is in a CTF. Or if you were on a live pen test in the real world in a bug bounty, what you would do is probably just send a ping with a time delay and then submit that and you would stop right there. But because this is a CTF, it wanted us to grab this user right here. And this is where we did it. We saved it in images and we needed the file name and the file.txt. So that is the last of the command injection that we're going to be covering and we'll move on to the next vulnerability all right in this portion of the course we're going to be covering file upload this can be a severe vulnerability especially if the file is placed somewhere that you can execute what you have uploaded and get back a shell on the server so file upload is one that you're going to see a lot in CTFs. They do happen in bug bounty programs. You can go and read on the hacktivity about some file uploads, but in the world of bug bounty hunting, most of the time they're probably not going to lead back to a shell, but in the world of penetration testing and CTFs, or if you're going for any kind of certification to become a penetration tester, then file uploads are always a good place to look and make sure when you're uploading a file to see if you can bypass any of the filters that may be keeping you from uploading a specific file with a payload inside of it. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into it. Come to the file upload. So we're going to be going through a few hack the box file uploads and the reason we're going to be doing hack the box is there really is no great place to practice file upload and hack the box really has the best systems to practice file upload if you have a hack the box subscription then you can open these up you can play around with them yourself and actually test these out if not in the world of bug bounty if you go to the hacktivity you can read about file uploads happening all over the place so file uploads do happen we're going to start really basic and then we're going to have to go through bypassing different filters within the file upload so this one is really one of the easiest and if you want to this box is called october with hack the box and its ip address is right here and i'm not going to show you how i got to this spot because really we're just we just want to see the file upload in action and what happens and why this would be a really huge vulnerability in the penetration testing world so the first thing we're going to do is we can click this file upload and I tested it. You can upload a file right here. And so what we're going to do is we can just click the file upload button and I'm going to show you two different ways to go about uploading files and testing this out. So the first is with a web shell and what we can do is we can come over here like we did before. And what we can do is we can go to Google and just look for web shells and I can just show you right here. I just typed in web shell and I scrolled down until I came to the Shushan 747, clicked on it and we're brought to some PHP web shells. This one right here is one of my favorites. It's the one I use the most. And we can just say that we want to create a gedit and we'll call it web.cmd. And sometimes you might have to name this like PHP if that's what this server is running in order to get a web shell to run. But we're going to run with CMD and we'll test this out. We may have to change that to PHP. I'm not really sure. And so we can come back over here. We can upload our web shell just like this. And if we go to the URL, this is a good sign that it didn't give us an error. Now we have to pass in a parameter because we have this right here it's going to call our web shell when we pass in the parameter cmd so we can come over here go question mark cmd equals and now we should be able to type in a command here and if our web shell works we will receive an output on the page so we can type in who am i and run it and this doesn't seem to work so we will rename this we'll just go move so we will type in our web shell and we will just move it from web cmd to web php5 and the reason i went with php5 is because right here i should have saw this the first time it says php5 so we can save this and now we can upload 
and we'll re-upload our web shell just like this and now we can click on it click here move that out of the way and we can put our parameter in here so we want a cmd who am i and now it tells us we are ww data and you can use this right here to try and get a reverse shell back over here but i think what we will do is we will just use the pen test monkey php reverse shell so we'll just say php reverse shell and it should be the first one and so what you can do is go to raw command a command c we will come over here and we will just say g edit and then we'll call it shell.php5 we can paste this in and then we'll need to change our port because we're listening on port 444 and over here we are listening on 10 my ip address is 10 10 14 point 6 we can save this come back over here we could probably close that out we'll upload this file we want our shell open and then we click this right here it hangs which means we probably have got our call back over here and we now have a shell on our box so i want to explain what is happening now that you've seen this the way a file upload works if you upload a file, you have to make sure that you know where the actual file is being stored because when we upload our malicious code, if you can't execute it on the server, it does you no good. So let's say you can upload some kind of shell like this web shell right here or right here, but you can't find the location on the server of this web shell to execute it, it does you no good. So you have to be able to locate it. And for us, this is a really, really simple file upload. You just click here and it takes you to the location right here of where our file is that we uploaded. So these, this is a really simple file upload. And we have this right here. It tells us it's running PHP. Sometimes it'll just say like we'll have a, a back end. It'll say something like backend.php like this. And then you'll know it's running PHD or if it's windows you may try aspx or asp and so you're just going to have to get familiar with the systems you're going up against and what you see on the particular on the server that you're attacking but this is a really basic introduction into a file upload we're going to do a couple more that are going to be a little more challenging which is also going to be a lot more realistic in the real world the chances you just come across something that just says file upload in a bug bounty is almost zero maybe on a penetration test it might happen but in the world of bug bounty probably not going to happen you're going to have to bypass some sort of filters and we're going to do some pretty simple filter bypassing in the next file upload all right we are here on the box popcorn same thing i'm not going to show you how to get here because we're just covering file upload and in this one we're going to talk a little more about bypassing different filters so if we come in here we have this edit right here and it tells us we can update the screenshot which is going to be this image right here and it tells us it allows a jpeg or a png and i've never tried jpeg so we might try that just on the fly and see what happens but we can save this right here we can go save image as and we're in our test file right here or test directory so we'll save that and if we come over here to update the screen sh the screenshot we will need to browse click on our little png right here update it and submit and it tells us that it worked the type was a png and now we should be able to come over to the uploads. We can type in 10, 10, 10, 6, and we'll go slash torrent. And then we want the upload just like this. And it tells us here is the image that we just uploaded. So that works. So what we will want to do now is see if we can upload some kind of shell. So we'll just use one of our PHP shells that we already have in this directory. 
and we'll browse and we can just try this shell.php5 and if we open this and we submit it it tells us we have an invalid file let's come over here and we will move our shell.php5 and we'll just call it shell.php and we can try this and it says invalid file now what we can try and do is intercept the request and see what the difference is between these so if we come to update this and we want to update this image again and we upload it and now we turn our intercept on and we submit this we can look at the difference and we'll send this to repeater just to save it and we know that this is going to go through tells us that it worked now we'll come back and upload our PHP shell and see what the difference is. So we can come over, we'll try our web shell this time, and turn on our interceptor, send it, we'll send that to repeater, and we can turn this off now, and we can come over to repeater and look at these and see what the difference is. So when you come over here and you look at this, Right here is what we're looking at. So we have a content type of image, PNG, the file name, which was the link that we downloaded. And then it tells us it's a PNG file. And we have all this mumbo jumbo right here. And so what we can do is just copy some of this and we can copy. And now we can come over here and we have a file type of web.php and then we have our little web shell that we used before and we could just paste this in up above and so our content type has now changed and we have these bytes to try and confuse it and then we have this image or we have our web shell right here so i want to show you a little bit of how a server would read this file type if we come in here and we just say gedit and we want to make a file dot we'll make a file.gif and we'll see what happens and we'll just put in some letters and we save this we close it and we go file and then we say file.gif it tells us that it is actually text so if we then come into our file.gif there are something there is something called magic bytes that we can add in here to try and trick it the way a gif starts is with a gif 89 or 87a and if we save something like this and run file on it now it tells us we have a gif an image type and the version so this is how a server would read this if you upload something it's going to run something like a file on it to see if it really is a gif or if it just has text in it and so when we copy all of this right here with the png basically what we're trying to do is trick it by putting something in like this gif 87a so that way when it reads it it will read it as a png and we'll actually try this gif because i've never actually tried it on this box so i don't know if it will work or not and we'll just try the file upload on the fly so if we send this over it tells us that it looks like it uploaded so we can see what it looks like it did upload so i'm kind of surprised that worked we'll go check it out so if we come over to our uploads we refresh the page and we open this up it looks like it worked we should be able to pass in our parameter of cmd equals and we can say who am i and it tells us right here www.data so that actually worked um, i was expecting it to not work and sometimes when you hit a file like this and it does not work it might check for just a dot png inside the file dot and then the dot php and if you just go out to Google and you read about different ways to bypass filters for P for file upload, you're going to have a lot of information. And that's really what I would recommend you to do. This is just the tip of the iceberg on how file upload works. So I'm just showing you some basic some basic ways to bypass it. But I would also recommend going out to Google and reading about how to bypass a PNG file upload filter or a JPEG and see all the different ways you can bypass and bypass this. So if we come in here and we send this and it renders, it tells us this worked as well. So we can actually go back. And if we refresh this right here, and it tells us that this worked so there's one other thing let's play around with the jpeg so if we come in here and we close out of this 
let's actually just play with it in repeater and see what happens. So if we say it's an image and we say, actually, let's try the GIF because we already have that set up and we just leave this like this and we delete all of this and we just type in the 87A with GIF at the front. Let's see if this works. It says invalid file. So let's take our PHP shell. We'll copy this and let's see if we can just say, let's G edit this file and we'll call it file PHP. And we'll add in the GIF 87A and then we'll put our PHP in here and we'll save this. And then we're also going to need our GIF file. So we have that in there too. So that way we can make sure that our content type right here is right. So we'll go to a proxy so that way it is ready. We can try this upload, browse. Let's upload the file with the GIF. We'll open, make sure that we catch this send it to repeater it looks like that is how it goes i actually want to turn this off it says that it worked okay so it does accept the gif as well now let's upload our reverse shell that we saved in file.php and we'll send this on over to repeater see how we have this application type is different so we can turn this off and see if we can get this to work as well so we'll send this and it says invalid file and when we send this it says that it worked so what we can try and do is just grab this like we did before we'll copy it and paste this in should be able to delete this does that actually have a semicolon in it it does so should work like that if we send it it says that it worked so let's go see if we can find that here's the gif it says it didn't work that's not surprising because it's not actually an image we need our other php shell Here's our GIF with our PHP in it. So let's try and pass in the same parameter equals who am I? And if we send this, it tells us this GIF works and it cannot execute the command within the file. Let's try and just delete this and see if we can get a who am I this way. We'll send that, come back, back, refresh, check out this PHP, and it tells us we're WW data. So it does let us inject a command with a GIF, but for some reason I wasn't able to get the web shell to work. But there's another way to go about this. So this would be a really roundabout way to do this. You could come in and we could try and upload like a Python shell in here or because we know we have PHP, we could put inside of here and so of, we could put inside of our command right here, instead of doing a system, who am I? We could come to this web shell and we could execute a PHP reverse shell like this, but you saw us use this recently. Let's just try and upload this PHP shell and see if we can get this to execute a reverse shell for us. So we'll come back over here. We can edit this again. We'll put in our PHP reverse shell. We can open. We'll need to catch this inside repeater. Turn our interceptor on. Submit and send over to repeater. We can turn this off, come to repeater, it tells us we have an invalid file, which we expect. We have the shell.php, and we'll just use the one with the PNG because we know that it's going to work for us. So we can come over here, 
and we can just highlight this, paste in the PNG. Now, if we send this, it tells us that this worked. We can set up a netcat listener over here, netcat, and I think we originally made that on port 4444, and now that's listening. So now when we open up that file, it should execute on the server, and it will give us a shell back. We can see our PHP file. We can see the size has changed. So we open this up and it's hanging and we have a shell return back to us and it's going to tell us I am WW data. So that is file upload. So there's a bunch of different ways you can play with this. If you have hack the box, I would recommend coming into popcorn because you have a lot of different ways to play with this. You have the JPEG, then the GIF, the PNG. And so you can just come in here and play around with these and see all the different ways you can get a reverse shell from a file upload. And I would recommend because we were not able to get the GIF web shell to work, you could play around with that and see if you could get a web shell rather than just executing commands one at a time. And then maybe see if you can get a reverse shell from the web shell because there will be times that you have to do that inside of CTFs. But in the world of bug bounty, you really wouldn't be trying to get a reverse shell. You could just simply do a web shell and a who am I for a proof of concept. And file uploads are something you're going to see, so you can read about those in Hack the Box. And I would definitely recommend going out to Google and continuing your research on file uploads. But like I said, there's really not a lot of places to practice file upload and it's because if there's a file upload that is going to be vulnerable on a server you can get remote code execution and for this reason hack the box is really the only place that is really good for file upload try hack me has a little bit of file upload but i don't think it's as good as hack the box when it comes to practicing this specific vulnerability try hack me is really great in other areas but hack the box is really good for file upload so with that i will see you in the next vulnerability okay welcome to the local file inclusion and the remote file inclusion also known as lfi and rfi portion of this course the lfi is going to be one that is more common than the rfi and the lfi is going to give us the opportunity or the ability to read local files on the server which could lead to a compromise of sensitive information or data that we're not supposed to be able to access and files on the server that we should not be able to access. The RFI is going to give us the ability to host up our own files and then have the server reach out to our server that we make on our Kali machine and then execute that file and will lead to remote code execution on the server. So we're going to jump into the LFI and the RFI now. Let's get started. Welcome to the LFI RFI, so the local file inclusion or the remote file inclusion portion of this course. We're going to be using TryHackMe for our example, and TryHackMe is just too good to pass up when it comes to practicing LFI and RFI. If you can afford a TryHackMe membership, then it is worth it just to come in here and practice your LFI and RFI along with other things and when it comes to hack the box hack the box doesn't have any really good place to practice and RFI so Sadly, you're not if you have only a hack the box membership. You're not gonna be able to practice this So what we have going on right here. This is a really great explanation I'm really happy with how they have this all structured So you have your basic web application right here You have the HTTP the URL and then you have a get.php and this PHP right here is going to be a giveaway of The way we're going to go about trying to pull this file down so oftentimes you're not going to see a .php, but sometimes you will. And when you see a .php and then a file equals just like this, you can think you can try for an LFI. And we've already talked about directory traversal. And typically if something is vulnerable to a directory traversal, you are going to be able to pull down files as well. And once you have LFI, which is pretty bad, if you can turn that into remote file inclusion, then you have got something really, really big going on for you. So we have this URL is going to make a get request to the server for a specific file, and it's going to equal the file that you click on. And I'm going to show this to you, and I think it will make a lot more sense. So I've already opened up the lab here. When we click on lab one, 
it tells us it's got this lab1.php and you can come in here and you can just type something in. So if we just type in anything because we don't really want to look for a file just yet. Actually, I'll just show you this way. So if we come in here and we type in Etsy pass WD and we say include, it pulls it down for us. But this is not this is not going to happen. That's not real world. So what will happen is something like this. You'll come to a page. It'll have like this request right here. You're searching for something and say it's a search bar and we just type something in and we intercept this in our proxy and we hit include. We'll send this to our repeater. We can turn this off. And now what happens is it tells us, we'll just pretend all this isn't here because this is not going to happen in the real world. But this will happen right here. This file equals and then what we typed in. Now this looks like what we had going on over here. And this really does happen. And up here, we can change this and we can now put in this Etsy pass WD and it will pull it down like this. And a lot of times you'll have this file equals up here and you can play around with it. But rather than using the URL, I would rather use burp. So we can come over here and we can say send. And I like that it tells us we have this Nginx server right here. And I'm sure if we ran like an in-map scan, it would tell us what we're up against completely, but we're not going to do that. We'll do that in just a minute with an LFI on a hack the box system and we will test it there. But we have this file equals and then we have right here where we can ask whatever file we can ask for whatever file we want. So right here we can put in our Etsy pass WD and we can send this. And on the page it tells us we have users here and when you're looking for users you can look for the bin bash that's going to tell us people who have actual users on this box there's actually quite a few of them or a bin sh not a bin bash we have root has a bin bash so when you pull this down you can look for users and it's even worse if you can access the etsy shadow file because then we can actually pull down password hashes and we don't have the ability to do that so this would be a file inclusion and you can pull down all kinds of files from the server so you can actually pull down um, let's say we wanted to look at the index.php you can send this and it'll pull down I can't tell if that worked or not um, because there's just a bunch of HTML let's render it maybe we can see it yeah so it just pulled down the home page like right here so you can look at different pages in here so let's say you were able to director you were to do some kind of fuzzing on this page and you were looking for different directories and you had a directory that you weren't allowed to look at like a hidden directory in here you could probably include this in the file and it will pull down that hidden page below right here and because we're able to do this local file inclusion when you have local file inclusion it's a great vulnerability to find it's one that it's a pretty severe vulnerability, but if you can turn this into a remote file inclusion, then it becomes something more. So right now we have what's called local file inclusion. We're able to get local files that are hosted on the target server. But if you're able to have remote file inclusion, that means we can include files from our box over here. So if you look at what we have in this file, we have a shell.php right here and a web shell over here if i have remote file inclusion i can i can have this git request reach out to my server over here that i can host up and i can host up this file right here and it will go get that file and then execute it and then i can have remote code execution on this server and i will own this network so what this looks like an easy way to test for this like if you were to do this in a bug bounty program and you were just looking for a proof of concept you would just type in sudo python2 with a simple server and then we would just put in our ip address and see if it reaches out to us so we can go http 10 to and we can send this and see if we get a hit over here and we do so this is so this means we can actually get remote code execution on this server. So what we can do now is close out of this. We'll rehost up those files. And I've already edited and I've already edited the shell.php so you wouldn't have to watch me 
change the IP address right here so it's all set up and ready. So we can host this back up. We can come over here and say netcat port 444. And if we send this right here, we want it to grab shell.php. And now if we send this, it's going to hang right here because we have a shell and we could say, who am I? And it now tells us we are www data. So we now have code execution on this server. And this would be pretty much as bad as it gets. Now I want to show you a little more local file inclusion and how to read pages when they don't render over here when we ask for a specific file and we want to see what's happening. And I'm going to switch over to hack the box for this. All right, I have loaded up the box poison here for us. And if you have a hack the box subscription, it would definitely be worth your time to open this up and play around with it. So you can see if you're able to find any of these LFI files on your own. So we're gonna go ahead and just play around with this for a little bit. And I wanna show you some of the things you can do with LFIs that can really save you a lot of time. And if you're doing CTFs, help you find files that are that you shouldn't be able to access. So we're going to do the same thing we did before. We'll just put in some characters in here and we're going to catch this over in our repeater. So we'll hit submit. We'll send this over to repeater. And then we can turn this our interceptor off. And now you can see before we didn't have this file right here with the browse.php and then the file and then our request. So you can, like I showed earlier, try and get files right here like this, which is fine, but I like to use repeater just because it goes a lot faster. So we're gonna go ahead and use repeater. So we'll hop over here, and if we send this, we get this simple message over here saying that it failed to find this through the inclusion, and it tells us the path we're using right here. So what we can do at this point is we can try and type in Etsy pass, WD and if we send this we can see we have the Etsy pass WD file we can you can see we have the Etsy pass WD file right here and something to always look through is these the server version you can highlight you can highlight this copy it go to Google see if there's any vulnerabilities and check that type of stuff out especially when you're hunting for bug bounties as well as penetration tests it's always worth looking at and then we can see the users on here is going to be this one right here and then we have root right here is a user the rest of these don't look like they have the ability to log in now on to looking for more files there's a really simple way to go through the files really quickly and i've used the tool fuff a lot with a lot on my channel so we're going to go ahead and we're going to use fuff and i'm just going to leave this in here and delete this a little bit at a time actually we'll just delete this whole thing so we can delete this what we'll need to do is highlight this and copy it paste it into fuff and then right here we're going to want to fuzz but to make sure we make it all the way back to the root i'm going to just put some of these dot dot slashes in here so that we can make sure we go all the way back to the root and then we're gonna fuzz and we don't want to fuzz this with the web content. What we want to look for is the LFI content. So we can come back over here and I think we just type in web. Nope, we don't want web shells. We want fuzzing right here so we can type in fuzzing and then we want LFI which is right here. So we're gonna go into that directory and see what's in here and we'll use this one because we're up against a Linux box. We can just type in Linux. That did not work for me. We'll type in like that. And now if we run this, it should work for us and it does, but we don't want all of that output. So we're going to filter by lines and we're gonna say if it has five lines, don't include it. And it's gonna give us all the files that we're able to look at. now. If I was actually 
doing a CTF, I would look through every single one of these to see what we can find. Now, obviously, we tried the Etsy Pass WD, but you can come through and check out all of these files and see if there's anything helpful for you to try and get remote code execution on the box. And because we don't have an RFI, which I have not actually tried, so we'll go ahead and try it and make sure that this does not work. And we can put my IP address in here, which is 10, 10, 14, 6. And it doesn't hang, no RFI. So we aren't able to include any of our own files to get a shell back that way. But you could look through all of these and see if maybe you can find some credentials or something, or maybe be able to SSH into the box. But this is a quick, easy way to fuzz when you have an LFI. And in a real bug bounty situation, you wouldn't want to actually enumerate any of this. You would only do something like that on a CTF. You would really just test for an LFI like I've already shown you and make sure that it is there. And then you would submit a report. Or if you were testing for an RFI, you would just do what we did right here and set up a simple server and see if you can reach out to yourself for an RFI. And that is the remote file inclusion and the local file inclusion. You can go ahead and play with these if you have a Try Hack Me and a Hack the Box subscription and get used to seeing these. You're gonna see them a lot inside of CTFs, especially LFIs. RFIs are a lot more rare, but they do happen. So with that, we will move on to the next vulnerability. All right, we are going to be going over some insecure deserialization. And I decided to make a little flow chart here so that you could kind of see what is going to be happening. And this is for PHP, but the concept is going to be the same for Python and JavaScript as well. But the examples we're going to be dealing with is PHP. So I decided just to show you PHP. It'll make it a lot easier for you as we continue going. We're gonna have just a few places to practice. This is something that there is not actually a lot of places to practice. So I wanted to show you here, and then I think I'm gonna show you an example, and then you should be able to solve a few challenges on your own. And if not, we will walk through them together, and I think you'll get the hang of this pretty quick. It's not super difficult, but it is something that a lot of people are afraid of. But nonetheless, let's jump into it. So we have what's going to be the waiter, and he is the object. This would be like if you have a inside of programming, there's something called object-oriented programming. And I don't want to get too much into it, but just know that like this is the object, and the object can contain different things with inside of it. So you have the waiter, and he carries a plate. And so with the waiter, the question would be, does the waiter have a plate and it's true or false this would be a boolean and within php it's represented as just a b and then it'll say b equals and it'll be one or a zero so that'll be either true or false so does the waiter have a plate and it would say true and so in this case it would say waiter have a plate b equals one and so you'd say here the waiter has a plate and then if he has the plate, we come down here and it says like, what is on the plate? Well, on the plate, there may be a username and the username, when you see these quotation marks like this is stored as a string. And so the username has a string. And so within a object, you would see something like S username, and then it would have the name and the S is going to stand for the string. And then you will have like maybe the person that is being and maybe the object is going to contain an age and so on the plate there's going to be more data and it is going to be an age and it's going to be 25 and it is an integer because it's a number and so this would be represented as an i so it'd be like i age equals 25 and it sounds confusing but we're going to see what this looks like here in just a minute and it will all make sense and i'll come back to this and show it to you once uh, once we get a look at once we look at the full picture of what this looks like inside of a cookie. So let's take just a step forward, just a little tiny step forward and look at how you're gonna go about ex exploiting this and then we'll go ahead and exploit some of these insecure deserialized objects. All right, so I have opened up a try hack me box here and sadly it's not a real great example for an insecure deserialization vulnerability because I already created a username with the name name my password is name and if we log in it brings us to this page but 
in the real world, if you came to something like this and you just fuzzed this with a fuzzer, let some like Fuff or Go Buster or Derb, and you would find this directory called admin and bam, you're here and you're in the administrator dashboard, which is uh, kind of a bummer because you're just automatically in here and it tells you like, here's the flag and you've made it inside of the dashboard. And so what we can do from in here, I want to test this in here and then we'll go back to our user profile and we can just inspect this like we normally would. We'll come over to the memory, which is where the cookie is going to be stored. We'll come over to the storage, sorry, not the memory, where the cookie is going to be stored. And it's going to say we have a password, our session, our se session ID, and our username and our user type. And in changing these cookies right here, you can manipulate the user type and the username. Now, inside of Burp, this also wouldn't be in plain text like it is right here. But if we intercept this and we refresh this and we say forward, and we'll come and we inter we have our interceptor on and we'll come to the my profile page again and we forward this to right here and we send this to repeater you can get a look at this like here's a username admin password right here like this is what we changed and we have this base 64 cookie right here let's see if we can decode it um we get we can get some of it but what you would do with this is usually not going to be in plain text it would be base 64 and you would have to decode it and then you can change these things right here so with that i want to send you over to port swigger and we're going to go to the insecure deserialization right here and we're going to walk through some of these and you're going to get the hang of them pretty quick they're not as challenging as you might think so we're going to do this first one right here and if you want you can go ahead and give it a try and see if you can figure out how to pull this off but i want to walk through this one right here and then we're going to go back to the flow chart because i think it's going to make a lot more sense once we do so you can go ahead and give this a try if you would like load it up here and the instructions tell us that we need to use a serialized base session mechanism and vulnerability and we're going to try and exploit it and it says here's our credentials to log in and we need to delete Carlos's account in order to solve this challenge so what we'll do is we can just come over here and we'll need to make an account and I'm going to call my account name and my password name I'm going to intercept this just in case we end up needing it so we'll intercept this we'll send it I'm going to send this to repeater. I don't believe we're going to need it though. So we'll leave that there. Come back over to our proxy. Um, oh, we have, we need to log in with the username that it gave us. So we have right here, our username and Peter. So we'll log in with this. And then it tells us we need to go to the to the admin panel we need to use the session cookie to get it, go to the administrator panel or privileges and delete Carlos okay so what we can do here at this point is you're gonna come to this on my account but we're gonna need to intercept the request it will look like this you can send this to repeater forward forward We'll send this to, I don't think we need that one, but we'll turn that off. We'll come back one, send this and see what it looks like. And what we can do is you might have this little interceptor thing closed, open that up. We can highlight this and it'll decode this for us. And it's going to tell us, are we an admin? And if you remember, this is the object right here. So the object is called four and it is a user. And then we have a string which we have our username and we have another string, which is our, well, right here is our username. And then it tells us we're an admin, which is also stored as a string. And then we have this right here, this Boolean, are we an admin? And it is set to false, but we can go ahead and change this to true. We can apply the changes. I'm going to highlight this cookie just in case this doesn't work. We can send it and it says, okay, it worked. 
if we refresh the page, it didn't update our cookie for us. So we're going to have to manually come over here and update our cookie. And right here's the cookie. Paste in the one we just made ourselves. And now if we refresh the page, we should have access to an admin panel. And we do right here. And you can delete Carlos if you would like this to say solved right here. The next one is going to be pretty pretty similar and uh, not really much more difficult than this. If you struggled, I struggled the first time with figuring out that I needed to actually copy the cookie and inspect and paste it in. That's okay. You're going to need to do that in the next one as well. But we can go ahead and hop over there and check that one out. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do this second one right here. And what you will need to do is I just opened it up in a new tab and I also opened up the lab so that way we don't have to wait for that to load. So we'll read the instructions and it tells us we're going to need to gain access to the administrator account and delete Carlos once again. And we have the same username and password. So if we come over here, we're going to do the same thing we did before and we will log in just like before. And now that this is logged us in, we'll come to our proxy. We're going to intercept the request, check out the my account page, send this to repeater, come over here, send it, see what happens. We get a 200 OK. And now we're going to mess with this cookie once again. And you can see there's it looks like there is a lot more going on in here than last time. But you can break it down just like before we have our object and then we have a string with our username right here. We have the username and then it tells us we have this string right here with our access token in it. And then we have this going on right here. So what we would need to do with this at this point is this access token is obviously going to be bad for us because it is going to be telling us what we can access and what we can't access. So if we just delete that and then we just put in here the B1 to make this true, we can apply the changes. We can actually send this to make sure we don't get an error. And it says 200 OK, which means this token should work for us right here. And so we can, I'm going to copy it out of the box just to make sure I don't get anything wrong. And now what we'll need to do is come back to our page. If we refresh this, nothing happens. Even though we sent it from burp, we'll have to inspect and check out the cookie over here. Change our cookie and then refresh the page and we have the admin panel. So this looks really easy, but this one actually took me like, I would say almost 15 minutes to figure out what exactly was going on inside of repeater. I am not a super great, I'm not real great with PHP. And so when I was trying to figure this out, I finally got this to go. Be, I accidentally left this in a string the first time, which is something you may have done. And if you try and leave this inside of a string, it is going to give you this error over and over and over again. That's one mistake that I made over and over as I was messing with this. And then the other mistake I made was I was able, I deleted this and applied changes. And if you send it, you'll get the same error and I forgot to delete this. So this is really finicky. And in the real world, you're gonna have to do pretty much what I did and just keep testing this over and over and over until you get a 200 and then you'll know that something has worked for you. And one of the other things that I didn't understand and I don't understand still. So if you know PHP, you might understand this better than I do. I have no idea why this says we have an integer of zero in order to get this exploit to work like i this is not how i solved it um, and i honestly don't have any idea why this access token is an i with a zero but it does work and the way i did it ended up working so if you come over here and you change this to a zero with the boolean you are going to get this error 
And then if you come in here and you solve it the way the solution says with the integer of zero, apply the changes, you can send it. It works this way as well, and this cookie works. But uh, just being honest, I don't know why this works. My version makes sense to me because I have the access token, and I'm just going to say that it's true that I have access to wherever I'm, I want to go and I send it and it works. So if you know why this works with an integer, you can feel free to leave a comment in down below because I'm really interested. I don't actually know. I actually Googled to try and figure out why this works with an integer and uh, I couldn't find anything. So with that, we will move on into the next vulnerability and keep going. Okay, so now that we have looked at the insecure deserialization examples we're going to come back to the flow chart so now if you remember the object right here so we have our object which is the waiter and it is carrying the plate and on the plate we have a username which is peter and we have the access token right here and so we have a object we have a string and another string right here and it says that this is also carrying a string and then we have our boolean, which is going to be true, which allows us to log in as the administrator. So now when you see something like this, you should be able to understand what's going on, at least without it being really, really complicated. So here's the flowchart. Once again, this is how the insecure deserialization works. I hope going from the beginning of this flowchart to now, it all makes sense and you can understand what is going on. I'll see you in the next vulnerability. Okay, so as we move into this next section, we're gonna be dealing with cookies and auth tokens. So I decided to go ahead and do the first half of the box, Luke on Hack the Box. It's gonna be dealing with a JSON web token and I decided to show you this because I wanted you to see walking through the process of finding a token and changing it and just how to understand what is going on. And then after we look at this box, I'm going to set you loose on two labs and you'll be able to practice manipulating these tokens on your own and then we'll do walkthroughs with those as well. I thought it'd actually be helpful to go through the first half of the box, Luke, so that you could see a little bit of the enumeration. And I've had a few people asking to do more with APIs and this box will actually show you how you can communicate with an API. I'm going to show you with the actual command line as well as enumerating an API with burp as well. And so we'll go ahead and jump into this. All right, I have already set up the box and I have it running. So we should be able to ping. The IP address is 137 and we can see it's a Linux box right here and it is all up and running and it is ready for some enumeration. We can run an in-map scan like this and so we can go ahead and run this in-map scan and we can see port 80 comes back really quick so we can run a go buster or we can try and use fuff on this box and we will use a directory list i imagine a small one would be just fine but we'll use the medium one just to make sure we're able to find everything that we need and i forgot to change the ip address here so we'll fuzz this while our nmap scan runs so we got 137 and we'll go ahead and send this on our way. We can actually come out to the IP address by typing in 10.10.10.137 since we know port 80 is open and we are brought to a web page like this. We can click around, see what's going on. You guys know I like to view the page source. I like to look at a lot of the hrefs and see what's in here. I wonder if it has a login in here, nope. And we can come back and see if Fuff has found anything. We got member, which was a redirect. We can check that out, see where it redirects to. And it doesn't tell us anything. And we can check our in-map scan is still going. We have port 21. If this was a penetration testing course, I would go out and check port 21 and FTP. But because it is not, I'm going to let these scans run and I'll bring you back once they have finished. It seemed to be taking longer than I anticipated. So what we're going to do is we're going to check out a GoBuster because I like to use GoBuster when I need to run an extension such as PHP and Fuff does not allow me to do this. 
So what we're going to do is come back over here and we're going to run our GoBuster with as well as Fuff with the extension PHP because this isn't this wasn't working for us and we have a bunch of stuff coming back so we can check out the login page this usually is not going to work in a bug bounty program but you can type in something like admin admin and it doesn't work and so you can try default credentials and see if it works usually there will be like a made by down here but there doesn't seem to be so we can't check for any default credentials on this page we have a config.php which is always a good thing to look at especially when you have code execution on a box because it will pull down often the username to the database which is root and we have a password as well and one thing you should know by now especially if you're in an Eden in an intermediate course is that people reuse their passwords so we can copy this password and we'll check our nmap scan and it has not told us but it will tell us when it is done that there is a port 3000 but before that you could come back to this login page right here and try and log in with root and that password we just copied to see if it would work and it doesn't you can and we could try admin with that password to see if it works and it doesn't. You could also try administrator or other things like that. But we're going to go ahead and open a new tab. And at this point we are going, and before we mess with this new tab, let's go and check port 3000. And we find that this has a, that we are getting back JSON and this is an API. So we are going to see what we can figure out it says an auth token is not supplied and we can curl this and see what happens and see if we can log in because that is how we're going to have this auth token so we can come over here and type in curl and we're going to use a post and then we will go http and the ip address 10 10 10 1 37 and we're on port 3000 and we want to log in and I can show you this right here if we go slash login and the way you would find this login page is by fuzzing the API which I showed in the beginner bug bounty course so we know that we need to authenticate because that's what it tells us and we need this login page right here and we need to pass in some parameters which is going to be our username so we'll go username and we were told the username root we can try this because that's what we saw on the config.php and we'll need a password as well and we can try the password that we found and then we can close all this off and send it and it tells us forbidden it does not work we're not able to curl it so you could come over here and try admin like we tried before and I spelled admin wrong and we get a token in return which is what we needed so now what I would do is come back here like this we're gonna go to burp and we're gonna intercept this request We'll send this to repeater and we can let that go. If we send this, it tells us, let's try login and send this. Okay, and we get an okay back and it tells us we need to authenticate. Now, what we need to do is create a token. And so we'll need an authorization token so we can go authorization and then we'll use a bearer and then we're gonna paste in our token right here and you can nice and easily highlight to see what's going on here so because this is a JSON token we have this right here and this is going to decode this for us over here in our inspector and if yours is closed you can open it up and we can see that this is just telling it it's a token looks like it's SHA-256 and this is the algorithm for it so you'll see this again later and so this is about the token 
And then this second part is going to hold the information inside the token. We have the username, admin. I think this is when it was created. I think this is the time that it would expire. And this right here would be the signing token, would be the signing key. And now we should be able to manipulate this. We'll send it and it says we need to authenticate. So what we can do is come back to our terminal and it says we have this token right here on the login page. So go back to burp. We have the login, we have the bearer, and I had to mess with my authorization here to get this to go through. We now have our JSON key right here with our username and our shared key right here. So now that we have this, we should be able to, now that we have this, we should be able to start enumerating the endpoints of the API and we can check out. And if you remember over here, where did we run that? Over here, we have all of these different things. And as we enumerate these endpoints, one of the first places we should check is something like users and we can send this and it says we get the users back on the box. And because we have this right here, and because we now have control over what is going on, we can go users, and then we could try and see if maybe there is an endpoint with this person. So we can copy this, paste it in, send it, and we now have a password for this user. And we can also go back and maybe see if this person has a password. We can copy it. Guess we don't really need to copy it. I could just type it out and send it. And we have their password as well. And with these usernames, you could go out and try and log in to the actual web page and see if you can figure out how to get remote code execution. But this is the direction of the box. Now we're not actually trying to get remote code execution. What I wanted to show you was these auth tokens and what you can do with them. So now we're going to come over here to our port swigger application here where we have the free labs to practice. And we're going to go all the way to the bottom that's where these are located and I think with what I just showed you you should be able to solve this first lab all on your own so if you'd like to go and give this a try then you can do that and if not we'll go ahead and walk through it all right so let's go ahead and read what we are supposed to do it tells us this lab is a JSON web token based mechanism for handling sessions due to implementation flaws the server doesn't verify the signature of any of the tokens that it receives to solve the problem we need to gain access to the admin panel located right here then delete the user carlos so i've gone ahead and clicked access the lab we can come open this up we are told we have the good old same username that we have been using and we can log in we'll log in just like normal we can come over to burp and we will grab the proxy and we can refresh this page and we see our cookie session right here. We'll send this over to repeater. We can turn that off. And now we can look at this token right here. We have this right here. We have the decoded portion of the cookie and then we can check this out and it tells us right here it was issued by a port swigger and we are signed in as this user so we'll change this to admin we can apply changes and now let's check out the see if we can go to the admin panel and it says let's see my account so it looks like we are able to go to the my account admin. So actually let's copy this, paste it in right here, delete that, send it, not found, follow the redirect. 
Where does it send us to? It tells us we need to log in. So that did not work. Let's try it again. Let's go my account. It tells us we are still logged in. So let's grab this again right here. We're told that we need to go to the slash admin in the instruction. So we'll come back to this, see what we can do with this token. We needed, was it admin or maybe it was administrator? Like this, we can go to the administrator, sign as and sign in. We'll try and sign in as the administrator, apply changes. And now we need to go to the admin directory. And this already looks different. We have the users right here. So if we wanted to delete the user, we could just copy this right here. And I think it should delete him. So if we send this, that does not work. So what we'll do is we'll just grab this entire token right here and we will copy it, come over here and we'll just put it in place of that one forward Turn the interceptor off. It tells us that we have solved the lab, I guess because we had the interceptor on when we sent the request right here to delete Carlos. It didn't refresh the page because the interceptor was on. So it went ahead and deleted the user for us. So that is one way to use these tokens. And they might be a little bit difficult in the beginning, but I really love this interceptor over here that just decodes stuff for you. Otherwise, you can try and decode this stuff by copying it like this. And you can come over to your terminal and you can go echo dash in just like this. And then you would just paste in the token that you wanted to decode pipe and then we go base 64 dash D and that will decode it for us you could also just come over to the decoder paste that in and decode as base 64 and it'll tell you over here as well so those are different ways to look at these cookies I'm actually curious now this leaves it all as a jumbled mess but I am curious if the decoder can figure this out and I accidentally copied it. We'll recopy this. Send this over here. And it does it does get some of it right here. If you didn't know that it was separated by the periods, you could have brought it over here to the decoder and you could figure out what's going on. It's not really that easy to read but you can see that we got the administrator right here and we were issued by port swigger so i mean you could have figured it out but that is this challenge there is another one right here that we are going to walk through so if you would like to open this one up there is a little more to it uh, I, i'm not sure you'll be able to figure this one out completely on your own but you can go ahead and play around with it and see if you can figure it out and we'll go ahead and I'll open it up and then we will solve it. We are, I have opened up the lab right here and we are brought to this page. The instructions are pretty much the exact same. We need to make it to this panel. We log in as this person and we delete this user. So we can come over here, go to my account, we'll get logged in and then we'll intercept the request. Log in. Don't save. It says we are logged in, so we'll go ahead and intercept the request. Send to repeater. We can shut that off. Come over to repeater, and we can do the exact same thing we had just done before. And we're told right here that we are that it's using SHA-256 as the encryption, which I'm guessing is going to be for our session key right here and so what we can do is come back up here 
and we can change this to none and then we can delete our session key highlight this and we are supposed to be the administrator this time we'll, we're supposed to be administrator learned last time that it is not the admin we can apply the changes and we'll come back over here and see if we can go admin and we can send this it says we are unauthorized let's try and look at this again I did not apply the changes right here so we can say none apply send this and we have made it and from here we know what we need to do with highlighting this and going over here and trying to delete it but I want to try this a little different this time so I want to copy this token and I want to put it in directly myself and see if I can make it over this direction make it over this way it m I think it should work try this a little different uh, and and it works so we can come over here and delete the user this way and you can put the session token in right here so these are a few different ways you can bypass authentication through tokens and session cookies you will just have to play around with these as you find them on live programs. They're not always going to be uh, like, they're just not always going to be really straightforward. So what you could do is look for what uses a period as a separation inside of a cookie or inside of a session token. And these are things you're just going to get used to over time seeing and not understanding what it is and then looking it up. This is also one reason it would be great for you to read the Web Hackers Handbook and other web application penetration testing books or even the Hacktivity because you're going to see things like this and you'll be like, what is this period? What is going on right here? And as you read, you will learn how to recognize these different things. It's okay if you didn't recognize them this time. I bet you will recognize it the next time you come across it. So with that, we will continue on. Okay, I decided to include this little section right here on attacking WordPress websites because to my surprise, the more I am in the web application testing world, I am surprised at how many people use WordPress. And even if they don't use it on their main site, there will be subdomains or sometimes they'll have other domains or subdomains that are also in scope that will have WordPress, especially if they have like a forms or a blog. So WordPress is something that you should be aware of and know how to enumerate and attack it. And so we're going to do a few hack the box WordPress walkthroughs now just until we get remote code execution or find vulnerable files. So that way you can see how you should attack WordPress and WordPress is becoming more common. So I decided to include this in here because I don't think a lot of people in the bug bounty world attack WordPress the way a penetration tester would. So we're going to look at these from a penetration tester perspective and how you would go about attacking them. But also along the way you can look for bugs as you enumerate WordPress sites. So let's go ahead and jump into this. All right, I have a spun up the box tenant for us to walk through. We're going to be doing two different boxes that have to do with WordPress. And I think this is something that you should really know well because you're going to see these definitely in CTFs as well as in bug bounty programs. A lot of bug bounty programs you'll notice actually will put the blog or some kind of forum sites in the not eligible category or out of scope which really is a mistake because a lot of WordPress sites actually do have vulnerabilities in them and you're gonna see them a lot in CTFs. And we're gonna cover a couple of those now. So I have already opened up, I have already started the server. So we are gonna be at IP 10.10.10.2.2.3. And then we can come here and we're brought to this default page. And one of the things we should always do is try and run Fuff or GoBuster. I'm going to use Fuff because it is already set up here for me. So we'll just change this to actually because this is going to be a WordPress site. We're going to run GoBuster because we will want to have this extension for the PHP right here. So we can come back here and set this up. 
two, two, three, and let that run. All right, so I got GoBuster working. It turns out that it wasn't working because I had been disconnected from the box, but now it is up and going, and we see that there is a slash WordPress. So we can come up here, type in slash WordPress and see what we come across. We come to this page right here. We can view page source, see what is in here. And there is an href to this tenant.htb. And if you're familiar with Hack the Box, and then you know that you frequently have to add things to your Etsy host file. And the IP address is 10.10.10.223. And it is tenant.htb. Now we should be able to save this and browse out to this page. So tenant.htb. I want to go here. And it loads this page for us. Now one of the first things you're going to want to do anytime you come to a WordPress page or a blog page in general is just look at these posts here and you can see you have protagonist as an author which could possibly be a user we can look at this one same user same author and we can look here same author there is a comment by Neil you could put this in your back pocket as a potential user and then it says did you remove a Seder PHP file from the backup I'm not really sure why somebody would have write this right here rather than let the person know elsewhere but you could try and come in here and type in the Seder.php and see if anything is there it doesn't look like it but you could come over to where we know we have this WordPress and we could say wp dash login.php my and you could try and log in with admin admin or admin administrator i think you actually can come over here and do an admin.php nope let's see if it's just slash admin and there is this login page it tells us it just redirected us here to the login page so not able to do anything with this and we'll just come back to that main page we can come back over here to this there was no sater.php but we could try it over here and we can run it and it tells us that it's grabbing users from a text file which would be interesting i wonder if you can go users.txt nothing and you go back and it just tells us success we're not able to actually grab any of those users so he said it was from a backup file and often when you see a backup file it's going to be a dot back and it works for us so we can save that to our downloads and we can cd to desktop we can move um i'm not sure what that saved as saved as sater.back so we can come over here, move, and then we'll go and we'll move this to the current working directory, which is going to be our desktop. Now, if we ls, we have it right here. We can cat that file out and look to see what's going on. Now, when I saw this, I had to go straight out to Google and look up serialization for PHP because I am not really familiar with it. And when you come out to Google and you just look up serialization for PHP, and then you can just click this top one. And when you look through here, it looks really similar to what we just saw. And then it actually walks us through how this works. So when I saw this, I was like, okay, this must be what is happening. And you're going to have a serialized object. And so you might even be able to go and type in object like this and let's see what happens if we get it into a json this is stack overflow and you can just look through here this is what i did to figure this out remembering that you're going to have to use your google skills and this looks even more like what we just saw right here 
So we know we're going to have to do something along these lines and we have it getting a repo and then it has this unserialized input being called. So what we can do is just grab this right here and we can make our own serialized object. So we'll do this here. We'll CD into the desktop and we'll gedit and we'll call it mine.php. And now we will change this to fit our needs. So instead of going user.txt, we'll go pwn.php. We can leave this because this is where this, this is going to be our object. And then inside the data, we can put in our little reverse shell that we have seen earlier. So we'll grab a PHP. Now we'll do a web shell first, and then we'll do a, a reverse shell to make sure that it works. For remote code execution, we can just grab this same one we've been using throughout this course. Where did my text file go? Right here. And we can just paste this in. And now instead of, we can, now we can delete this, delete this extra line here. And up here, we're going to say mine equals new and then I'll just copy this so I don't have any typo. And this looks like it should work. Let's try it real quick. So we can just say PHP, mine.php, and it tells us we have a syntax error at the CMD. So we'll come back inside here. Okay, and thanks to the magic of video editing and much debugging here, I finally got this to work. I had in here, I had left in here the public function to update the database and I had spelled serialized wrong, which took a little while for me to figure out what was wrong. But now we get this output and this looks really familiar with what we have just went through with our JWT tokens. So now if we, now if we copy this string right here and we come back to our page, we should be able to enter it in right here and pull down a web shell. So if you remember from this right here, we have this a repo being called so we can come over here and we can add this in by deleting the back, add in a parameter and we can say a repo equals and then paste in the serialized object that we just made. It tells us that it has added it and now we should be able to come to our CMD and see if we have code execution on the box. So let's give this a try. Delete all of that and say what did we name? I think we named it mine.php. So we named it pwn.php. So we can come up here and we can say pwn.php cmd equals who am I and it tells us we are ww data so now we should be able to get a reverse shell on this so we can come back to our reverse shell cheat sheet since we know this is running php we can try this with php we can paste this in my ip address is 10 10 14, 7, and we'll go on port 4444, and we'll go bin bash, and we can set up a netcat listener, just like this, and we're also going to grab this in burp just in case it doesn't work, we'll send to repeater, we can turn that off and it doesn't work so we can come back to burp here and if we send it, it tells us that it went through really quickly and it turns out that I am dash seven and we send it and we get a call back so I had my IP address wrong that entire time that I was trying to get that to work so now I actually want to go back and try my PHP shell and see if that works. Where is my PHP? 
come back over here, paste that in, one, two, three, four, this is a seven, 14, 10, grab all of this, URL encode it, kill this shell, try a new one, send, and the PHP one works also. So that was a bit of a workaround, but I think it'll be helpful for you to see one more WordPress box just to see that the enumeration process for WordPress is going to be a little different and know that you're going to be looking at everything in PHP. So I wanted to show you this one because it just came off of what we saw with a serialized object like this. And I thought it would be helpful for you to see a little bit of code outside of, I thought it would be helpful to see how it would work with WordPress with PHP. And with that, we will go ahead and attack another WordPress box. Okay, so I've gone ahead and ran an in-map scan. And remember, if you run an in-map scan, to do so just on the common ports or the most common ports because your target, if you're doing a bug bounty hunt, you don't really want to just be banging on their door looking for a bunch of open ports. But if you're doing a penetration test or some kind of CTF, then you can scan all ports. I've scanned all ports here. But just remember, if you're bug bounty hunting, to only scan the common ports. And if you are scanning quite a few ports, maybe slow down the in-map scan. With that said, we have three ports open, port 22, which is SSH, port 80, HTTP, and then we have MySQL running on 3306. So the first thing to do is just come out to the HTTP server and see what is here. And it tells us that we have, it says there's an issue tracking until it's set up. We can check out these links right here and see if they take us anywhere. And it tells us right here, it's taking us to spectra.htb. So we probably need to add this to our host file so we can sudo gedit, sudo gedit our Etsy host. And now that that's added, we can try and come back here and see if this will load for us and go and see if we get anything different this time. And it looks like it's working. I must have spelled it wrong. So it tells us there's an error establishing a connection, a database connection. So that doesn't work. Did we test this one? And we get a WordPress site right here. And this is a basic WordPress site. We are told that it is up to date. It's powered by WordPress. And one of the things to look at is there is a user, which would be administrator, see who commented. And we don't have anything. It just says a WordPress commentator. So there's probably not another user there. We have this right here, this P1. Uh, it looks like that could potentially be different users. So you could come up here and just try and enumerate this. It'd be easier to send this over to burp and try and do this. Now it says we have page IDs. We can look for different pages, but I'm not going to run down this road just yet. While we're on a WordPress page, one of the best things to do really on any kind of page is to fuzz it. So we will do two different types of fuzzing. We will fuzz with the extension PHP because we are on a WordPress page. So we can come back over here and it is 229. And we can run this actually. I'm not sure that will work because we are on a virtual host. We'll go SPE spectra .htb and see if that fuzzes and it says that that's working so we have this main and then also i want to run fuff and see if we can pull down anything else right here on this server we actually want to run this on spectra.htb and we've pulled down main and testing so we can come over here and we can just type in testing and we are brought to a bunch of files. We've already been to index.php. One of the things you should always check for when you come to a page like this, when you see these config files, config is always a very yummy place to search for vulnerabilities. We can view page source. We know that when we see a blank page that there might be some hidden files. And over here we see we have a database user and we have the database username. Now we saw that 
on this nmap scan, the MySQL was open and you could try to log into MySQL and the way we would go about this is typing in my SQL and we'll put in the host 10, 10, 10, 2, 2, 9. And then the username was right here, dev test. So we would go dev test. And then we could for our password and then see what happens like this. We can copy, paste. And see if it will let us log in and it tells us we're not allowed to log in and it looks like it's because of our IP address here it is not allowed to log in which is fine you probably have to be running on the local machine to log in so what we can do is we can actually come back to this page right here and we see that your the admin is allowed to log in so we have a WP admin so we can open a new file, type in spectra.htp, come back over here. We can try and log in with the WordPress-admin, and that keeps sending me it to and every time we type in this WP slash admin it keeps sending us to Google. So we're going to turn this off. We're going to come over here and say about config, accept the risk. And we're going to go a keyword. And we're going to set this to false. Now that should be saved and close out of it. Now, if we come back and we type this in, it should stay on track. WP admin. And it loads for us. Now, if you remember, we saw, I think it was administrator like this. And then we can grab this password and see if maybe this person is reusing a password. Log in, and it tells us that the administrator email verification, we can just say remind later. We don't need to mess with that. And it allows us to log in, even though it didn't load very pretty. We can try again, and since that's not working, that's fine. The way you're gonna see this on CTFs a lot, and you will see this in the future, is to come to the themes right here. And we really need this to load for us. And it loads for us, and now we can come to, while that loads, there is one thing that you should always look to run on WordPress sites, on WordPress sites and that is a WP scan. So we can go WP scan, and then we would run dash dash URL. And then on this box, we would run the box name and the page was main. So this is gonna look for the plugins because sometimes there are vulnerable plugins on these WordPress boxes, especially if they don't update them. So it would look like this, aggressive dash enumerate and then we want all plugins. So if we were to run this, it would look like this. And the reason you would need to run this plugins detection aggressive is because we want it to enumerate all the plugins, not just the ones that it finds in the source code. So if you're ever up against a WordPress box, especially in a CTF, this is something you would want to run. But now that this has loaded, we can come over to our themes and look inside of the PHP code right here inside the 404 template.php and we can actually add in a reverse shell right here so we've seen this earlier in the course we can go php hp reverse shell and then we can find pen test monkey and just grab this entire web shell or this entire shell and we can just edit the ip address and the port number so we'll go to the reverse shell go raw Command A, Command C, come back to this spot where we were. We can just paste all of that in. 
come all the way up to the top, change our IP address to 10, 10, 14, 7, and we'll listen on port 4444. We can update this, make sure we have, see if we can start up a Netcat listener listening and it tells us this right here updated successfully so we can come back to whatever page that was that we were just on this one right here now if we delete this and we just run this it should execute that code for us that we just saved it says that it has updated successfully Make sure we have the port and IP number right. It is. And we got the reverse shell back over here. So who am I? And we are finally on this box. Sorry for a bit of the workaround, but this is just really the life of doing any kind of hacking. It is going to be a lot of trial and error and fixing mistakes. So this is WordPress. So these were a couple of WordPress boxes. You're going to see WordPress in the future, especially in the world of bug bounty hunting. WordPress is really popular. And this is just a few different ways to go about hacking WordPress sites. So with that, we will continue on. All right, so I have decided to include this little section here on making a GitHub recon tool in Python for you because I figured if you have went through my first bug bounty course, I had this section on the understanding the basics of Python. And as you become a more well-rounded bug bounty hunter or penetration tester, your programming skills are going to improve as well. So I decided this tool was easy to make. It includes a lot of really easy concepts within Python, but it is actually a lot of code, I guess, if you are a beginner. If you're gonna continue down the road of penetration testing or bug bounty hunting, you're going to wanna to develop your own tools and have a better understanding of Python, and I figured this was a really great tool to give you an idea of things you can actually build that are useful. And even with this tool, you can add on to it and make it your own and give it new functionality. So I've decided to include this in here because it will help you and save you time in the future if you decide to continue bug bounty hunting. So enjoy this tool and use it well. Okay, so the setup for Selenium is gonna take a little while and I don't want you just to close out and think this is too hard. I wanna show you how cool this tool really is. So if you follow along with this video, in the end you're gonna have a program that, and you're gonna understand all of this code and then you're going to have a program that goes out to github for you and goes through the repos opens all the pages goes through all the links and pulls out if there's any passwords or not stored in the code on the github page and so it will look like this when you run it and it automatically went through all of those links on github it pulled down this page right here it says a password was found at this link and so if we click on this link it'll take us to this page right here and we can look at this and we can go to the raw and we can type in password and right here it tells us it has found password and the password is admin and it found this on this github page so that is where we're going and if this tool looks like something you would like to add into your bug bounty or a penetration testing arsenal then you can stick around and go through and make this tool with me. We start with our program and using Selenium. There's a few things that you have to do, and I'm gonna walk you through installing this both on Mac and Windows. You will need your PyCharm editor that we used in the first Python for Ethical Hackers. And now you are going to need Google Chrome installed. And so I'll have this link down in the description. If you don't have Google Chrome, it is best if you use it. You can also do it with Firefox, but it's really easy if you just download Google Chrome and follow along with me. And we're going to also need to install the Chrome Web Driver. So what you will need to do is download the version of the Chrome driver that matches your Google Chrome installation. In order to find out what version of Chrome you are running, you will come up here, click the three dots, you will go down to help, and you'll click about Google Chrome. And then I am running this version right here in order for me to update my Google Chrome if it doesn't match any of these over here then I would just have to close out of Chrome completely. You just go and close the app and it will automatically update. 
and I am running this version right here, 101.0, and I would come back over here and I would say 101.0. For me, it would be this one. I would click this and then it will bring you to this page, it looks exactly like this, and it will tell you what version of software you're running and you will click that version. So if you're running Windows as your operating software, you click Windows, Mac, Mac, or Linux. For Mac, I use this one right here. And when you install it, remember where you put it because we are gonna need to know the complete file path in order to reach the Chrome driver. I have mine stored right here in a folder on my desktop. So if I, if I open this up, I have my Chrome driver right here and I will need to know where this is. We will need to know the entire path and you can do this. You can see the full path by clicking, by right clicking and going to get info. And then it will tell us where the full path is at right here because it tells us where and then we say Mac user Ryan desktop the folder is developer and then we hit the Chrome driver so you'll need to go ahead and install Google Chrome and then install the Chrome driver and we will continue walking through how to finish setting up Selenium when you have finished doing that after you have downloaded the zip go ahead and unzip it and it will automatically unzip into your downloads and then you can drag it into a different folder like I have I've just made one called developer and you can go ahead and drag yours out of your downloads or you can leave it in your downloads if you choose the only reason I move it out of my downloads is because sometimes I go and delete everything out of my downloads folder and I don't want to delete this if I am using it. For the Mac users, after you've downloaded this and you have moved it into your location where you would like to keep it, for me, I'm going to just go like this. I will open back up this folder. I'm going to show you what we did earlier. Just go to get info. You can now copy this as your full path and then we can say our Chrome driver, so we'll go CDP for our path, and then you can paste it in here just like this. And I believe we need our to go slash Chrome driver, so we'll go slash Chrome driver. And this entire thing will need to be inside quotations. Now I'm going to cover the installation of Selenium for Windows users. Okay, for our Windows users, what we're gonna do now is click Chrome driver Win32 and it will download. We will open up where this is. It's gonna say we want to, how do you wanna open this file? We'll just say, we'll just go ahead and open it. It says we now have this Chrome driver and it tells us that this is an application. If you don't have any place in particular you want to store it, go ahead and put it in your C drive. But before we do that, we'll just open this up. We will make a new folder and do the same thing we did on the Mac and we will say developer and we'll just leave this here and we can go back to our downloads where we grabbed this folder the and we extracted our chrome driver and we're going to put this into the developer now the reason i had you do that is because when you look at the location of where this is stored it is really simple to get to it tells us that it is in c slash developer we can copy this we will put it inside of a string and then we will put slash and now we will do the same thing we did on the Mac and we will say the Chrome driver path and now we have that stored as a variable. Sorry to my Windows friends, I forgot to mention that when you run this Chrome driver you will need the .exe in order to get the executable to run and pretty much everything from this point on is going to be the same as I run it on my Mac. If you have any problems please let me know in the comments and I will try to help you out. Okay we are ready to install Selenium so the way we're going to do this is we're going to import Selenium just like this and because I have done it before and I have already installed it on my Mac this is here and ready for me but what you may need to do is it will have a red squiggly line and it'll pop up a window like this and you're gonna click install or import I can't remember which it is but I think it's install and you'll click install and it will take just a second to go ahead and install that and then what you're gonna want to do is type in from Selenium and then we're going to import 
the web driver now that you have installed Selenium and typed in from Selenium import web driver. We're going to initialize our web driver and we're going to type in driver equals web driver dot chrome because that's the browser we're using. There are other browsers if you've chosen to go that path. And now we're going to type in our executable path. And the reason this is yellow is because this has to be capitalized like this. And we're going to type in executable path, which I believe is actually deprecated. And I have not gone back and read the documentation for the new way to run this without the executable path. But we're going to type in CDP. It's just going to give us a error when we run this, or it's just going to give us a warning saying that this is this version is deprecated for running the window the web driver. But that's okay. We will get our program to run without it. It just means that they are not updating the executable path like this anymore. And now what we're going to do is type in driver.get and we're going to type in something like www.google.com. And then once this is done, we're going to want our driver to close the window. So you can type in driver.close, but I don't like to use driver.close personally because it just closes the window, but we will be still running the Chrome down here in our browser. I want it to, to quit. I want it to close that window all the way out to save on my memory space on my Mac. So we're going to type driver.quit just like this. And if you run this like I will and you are on a Windows, it's automatically going to run for us. It should open without any warnings and give us google.com and then it will close this page for us. All right, the reason this is giving this this error is because we need to type in https slash slash google.com. Now when we run this, it should open up Google for us and close the file. So that is how we run it. But if you're on a Mac, if you're on Windows, that worked for you and you didn't get any problems. If you're on a Mac and this is the first time you've ever ran Selenium, you're going to get a little error that pops up with a window and it's gonna say move to trash or cancel or close, you're gonna click cancel or close out of your two options. You're gonna come up here, you're gonna go system preferences, you're gonna go security and privacy, and right here it will say that you tried to run a Chrome extension and it was blocked. You will click allow. If you're not allowed to click allow, you can unlock it by clicking this and typing in your password to unlock your Mac, and then click allow, and then you can relock it. Then when you close out of this and you rerun it, it will give you the option to open anyway and you'll have a new pop-up and you will just click open and it will begin running and working for you just like this on your Mac. Now it is time to begin some of our web scraping. Okay, so we are at our screen and it looks like this. I've decided to go ahead and show you how to get rid of this deprecating warning. So when we run our program and it runs this right here telling us that the executable path has been deprecated, just in case they stop using this in the future, I wanna go ahead and show you the way to get rid of this. I'm gonna use running the executable path because I believe that it is faster and I might be wrong and that's okay and you can run Selenium however you choose. You can run it the deprecated way or the current version. I think they're at version 4 if you choose. But we'll have to import a few more services from Selenium. So we'll go from selenium.webdriver.chrome.service import and then we're going to import service and then we're going to need to import the Chrome driver manager. So we're going to go web driver manager dot Chrome and we're going to import Chrome drive manager just like this. Now I'm going to comment this out because I'm going to use it as we go through, but you can delete this if you want to use the non the non deprecated version. And I think you're still going to get these red inputs down here or these red warnings that's going to tell you like it's installing the newest version of the web driver every single time you run it but uh, that's okay and we're going to type in s equals and then we're going to type in our service and then we're going to run our chrome driver manager and we're going to call this and then we will 
call it the install function and the reason we're going to do this is because every time you run this service it is going to check to see what version of Chrome you are running so we'll just comment this out so we're not getting this warning and this dot needs to go I did this wrong we'll go like this all right it is not wanting to work for me so we'll close it off manually and then we're gonna hit dot install right here we're gonna call this method and then we have to close off this whole line here and now we're gonna turn this over to our driver and it's going to equal the web driver dot chrome and then we're gonna use the service and it's going to equal s just like this now if we uncomment our driver down here will have no errors and when we run this it will now work for us and it's going to tell us we are using this is the version of Google Chrome that we're using if you remember we checked our version earlier and then we installed the Chrome driver and it tells us we have the Chrome driver that matches our version and it is found in cache so it now works this is the non deprecated way to run this tool I decided to go ahead and show this to you like I said just in case the way right here the deprecated version to get to the Chrome driver is no longer supported in the future. All right, I have gone ahead and commented out this code and I'm gonna use the Chrome driver that is on my computer that we already installed. There's one more thing we're gonna to need to import in order to not get any deprecation errors and that is the by. We're gonna import by. So we're going to type in from selenium dot, dot web driver dot chrome or sorry not chrome dot common and then we're going to use by and then we're going to import and then by like this if i can get back there like this and this is another update with selenium the way i originally learned selenium we didn't have to use this but they have updated it again so we will need to use this by module here so what we're going to do is open up Amazon and I'm going to show you how this scrapes. If you've ever wondered why you have to answer questions to make sure you're not a robot, you're going to find out in this course. So if we come over to a web browser and we type in Amazon and we go to Amazon and let's say we want to buy a new drill bit so we just say we want a drill set okay we're getting a drill set not a drill bit and we click on this drill and we really want this drill but we don't want to pay forty three dollars for it we want to pay thirty eight dollars for it we can actually set up our web driver to go out and check this price for us so what we would do is we would inspect this and we can look for the class right here and it's going to tell us that it's 43 so you could set this up let's say instead of 43.99 we don't really care about the 99 cents and we just want it to be less than 38 so 37.99 would work we could use this span but for the sake of getting the 99 involved we will use this one right here for our project so we'll go ahead click on this and we're going to use this class right here and we're going to grab a class out of these right here and we want to grab one that looks really unique that isn't going to be used anywhere else and this class looks really unique to me so i'm going to go ahead and copy this and then we'll come back over to our chrome driver And underneath of our google.com we're going to type in price equals and then we want the driver to scan through all of this source right here the HTML and we're going to tell it we want to find an element and we want an element by a class name so we want to make sure we don't have elements by class name we want a single element by the class name later we're going to use the one with the s and this is the deprecated version i forgot this is the version that i learned when i was using this what we do here now 
is we delete all of that and we delete that and we come in here and we say by dot class name and in here we're gonna put that class name that we just copied just like this. The next thing we need to do is update this HTTPS right here and it needs to be this URL right here so that way our Chrome driver opens up the right URL, scans through all the HTML, it's going to look for the class name that possesses this and then we want it to print the price like this. So we'll say print and then we want to print the price. So if we run this how it is right now I'll show you what our output is. It gives us this as our output and this is not helpful. So what we need to do in order to grab the plain text is type in text. So now if we run it, it's going to print out for us our $43.99. And I'll show you what would be useful if we're we're really going to turn this into a web scraper for us. It really would be useful to get rid of this 99 and just use this right here. So you can see why it's printing the way it is. This span, 43.99, and it's given it to us on different lines. So we should be able to copy, let's try this class right here. And this really is, when you're making these, going to be a lot of a trial and error, as you're going to see in a little bit when we make our new dumpster diving ethical hacking tool and we try to automate some of our recon, where it's going to be a lot of trial and error. So we'll let this run and we get the dollar sign. That is not what we want. So we'll try this one and we will paste this in here and now we can run it and see what comes back and we grab just the 43 so now if we wanted this to run say every 20 minutes to see if Amazon has updated their price and brought it down below $38 we're gonna put all of this inside of a function that is going to get called every 20 minutes and we're going to have to import a new module for this and we're going to do that in the next section. All right, now that we have our web scraper working, let's say we wanted to go out and check the price every five minutes or 30 minutes or whatever we want it to be and then let us print it into the console. What we would do in this case is put this into a while loop and so what we can do is take this and we can say while on and then we want the on to be true all the time so we'll say on equals true and this should be familiar to you if you have gone through the first part of our python for hackers and then we're going to need this inside of a function that gets called every four seconds or 30 minutes and we'll need this inside of a function that gets called every so many minutes in our case I'm going to set it to only five seconds so that way we don't have to wait very long but in a real case scenario you would make this run maybe once a day or every couple of hours to check the price but for now we're going to make a function and we're going to call it five we'll call it five seconds we'll call our function and then we will need all of this to be inside of our function. And now we need to call the function like this and we will say five seconds. And then we are going to take this and we need this to sleep. So we'll say time dot sleep and you will need to import time up here if you have not already. And we're gonna say sleep for five seconds. Now when we run this, it's going to take five seconds. It's going to launch our driver, go out, check the price and print it down here in our console for us. And then once it gets done doing that, it's going to wait five more seconds and then it is going to launch the browser again and check the price for us and it will do this for all eternity because we are inside what's called an infinite loop there's no way for this loop to end and so it's just going to keep on going and printing for us the price until we stop 
the program. So this isn't really helpful for us in the world of hacking. So we're going to stop here. I just wanted you to get this concept down of using Selenium, setting up functions, using a while loop. If we were to use this completely for our daily use, we would have to make an if statement and say, if the price is equal to or less than $38, then have it, we would import another module and we would have it send us an email or a text message saying the price is ready for us to go and buy it. But we're not gonna finish this out because it's not really gonna be helpful for us in the world of hacking. So we'll move on to building our actual tool for hacking. Okay, I have cleaned out my text editor here just to get it down to the bare bones of what we are going to need as we build this tool. I have put this right here. This is the GitHub repo that we're going to be going through and dumpster diving for. Now this should work for any GitHub page if we program this right, but I made this GitHub page just for us to test against to make sure our tool is running. I didn't want to spam an actual GitHub account that is in use. So this is just a GitHub account that I made for the purpose of showing you how to build this tool. So what we're going to make in the end is a tool that when we run it, it runs what target would you like to run against. And so we're going to copy the URL of the GitHub page that we want to scan. And when we run it, it's going to go out to GitHub. It's going to click on the repo. It's going to click on the pay on the code. It's going to go to the raw. And then it is going to tell us a password was found inside this page. And so what you could do is just copy this or click on it and it will take you to this GitHub page and you can search for where this password was used. So we're going to make a very basic program just like this one. And I hid a lot of the code. It's down there. I didn't want you to get a head start. So as we make this tool, when we're done, it's going to be very basic, but I would challenge you to make it your own and add to it different files that you wanted to search for different keywords, make it print the entire line where the password's found. So you don't actually have to go out to this page and check it. These are things that I've done. I, with my tool that I've made just like this. And so I want to show you guys how to get started making this tool and then add on to it and make it your own. Okay. As we go through building this tool, there are a few things we're going to do at the beginning that I'm going to tell you to change at the end to make the, the entire tool work well for you. So what we're going to do at the beginning is we're just going to get rid of this right here because we want to put in our repo that we're going to be scanning against. And I'll leave that GitHub repo up unless it ends up getting taken down by GitHub because it is getting scraped over and over and over by people from all over. But until then, I'm going to just leave this GitHub page up for you guys. So we'll just put that inside of our GitHub page and now we can comment this out and it should open up that page for us and then quit. And it did. So there it ran. And what we're going to do in the end is we will change this and we will make this an input, but we're going to cover that at the end when we get to that section. Now that we have it, so it'll open up this page for us. We want it to grab something for us by an element. And because usually there's a bunch of repositories in here, we're going to just use the repositories instead of getting the element by, let's say the class name get at the element we're going to make it get elements by class mate by class name and i'll show you what i mean in just a second so we'll go in here and we will say we need this class titled repo okay and this is what these will be titled as for us and we have this anchor tag right here so what we're going to do is we'll do the same thing we did in the last one we're going to say that the repository and we'll name this as We'll call this our res for resources, and we're going to turn it into a variable, and it's going to get for us all the repos by the class name. So we'll say driver dot find element, and then we want this to be an S, 
And the reason we want this to be an S is because we want to find all the elements and we're gonna store them inside this variable. Now for this cause, there is only one right here, but this should work with many repos if you scan a GitHub page with many elements with the class name of repo. So we'll go, we'll continue and type in by dot class name. We don't want a class, we want the class like this class name and the class name is repo just like this now if we run this it will go and it will click this page and then it will close so what I want to do is I'm gonna add in time dot sleep and we'll make this two seconds so that we can see what's happening and then we'll make another time dot sleep right here so that you can see that it clicks on to the next page so we'll run this it's going to open wait two seconds and then it's going to open this repository right here and close so now what we are so now what we need to do is make a for loop so that way we can print the repos that are on this page and in this case there's only going to be one but we're going to go ahead and make this for loop and we'll say for i in all these listed resources we want to print and we want to print i and what we would do here is we'd say print i dot text because we want to see it in the text format and then it will quit for us i should have gotten rid of the sleep for us uh, and i see i spelled that wrong and uh, that's okay i made that repository late at night and it's all right that it uh, isn't quite right. It's still a repository and we can still scan against it. So it prints for us this repository right here. So now that we know, we can loop through all of the resources that have the element class name repo, we need to figure out how can we click on those. And there is a click function that we're gonna use later. But right now, I want us to go through and see how we can do this a different way. It's gonna be a little more complicated, but it's always best to know there are multiple ways to do something, especially in the world of coding and in the world of hacking. All right, because we're not gonna use the click function, we need to see what happens when we click on this link right here. Now this is something in cybersecurity that you're gonna to need to always do. When you're testing a page, not that we're testing GitHub, but when you test a page, it's always good practice to click and see what happens, how to use the page to see what's going on. And what we're gonna do is check out this URL. So this is the URL that we start out with. And since, since it just changes the repo name as into the new directory, what we're gonna need to do is take this directory and put it into a new link and get our web driver to open this up. Since we know we can run this, and I'll go ahead and comment out these times sleep because we don't need those no more. Since we know we can run this and we can get it to scrape all of the repositories and then print them down here, now we can just save these into a list and then we can loop through that list and get it to append that to our URL. This is a little more complicated than the click function, but it's helpful because we will need so that way we can get it to open every single repository that we go through in the future when we go through a page that has a lot of repositories on it. So what we will end up doing is making a list which you've seen in the past. And if you want, you can pause the video and see if you can figure out how to make a list on your own if you remember. And so I'm just gonna name our list as links and we're gonna make it empty. And what we are going to do now is we're going to take this and we're gonna say links dot append, which I don't think you've seen before, and we want to append i. So now if we take this and we move it over and we print, we need to append i dot text, so that way we get it right, i dot text. And now we print the links right here. We should get the repository to print from our list. So we'll run this and give it a test and it says we have repository and we have the brackets and it is inside the list. So what we will do now that we have this list is we're gonna make another for loop and we can comment this out because we don't need that to print every time. And in this for loop, we're gonna name it for 
L for the links inside the links list, we're going to make a new we're going to make a new variable and we're going to call it next page. And this is when I tell you my variable naming becomes very poor because I'm not very creative. And we're going to make this an f string and we're going to call the repo and if you remember and we're going to call the repo but we need to first name it something so we need this url to be assigned to a variable and so we'll just call this our repo and at the end we're going to change this because this is going to be an input and we're going to make this a string just like this and now we have this repo right here and we'll add a slash so that way we don't have to later Actually, we'll delete the slash and we'll add it down here in our string. Give us some practice with that. So we're going to take this repo, and because it's a variable, it needs to be in an F string with these curly braces. And we're going to add in our slash, and then we will add in another variable, which is going to be our L. So what would happen if we had a bunch of repos? This is going to go through all of the links, which we saved right here as our resources. It's going to get all the links, this for loop, is going to run through all these links and it's going to put them into our list that we have called links and if you remember this is where our repositories will be saved now we need to loop through there and in this for loop it's going to loop through our links and it's going to give us a new url so what this url will look like after it runs through this this second for loop is it will look like this and it will come out with our repository that I spelled wrong and it's going to open up this page and it will go and click this link for us so this is the repo we want to attack it will click this and it will bring us to this page so let's try go ahead and try this we're going to run this with a sleep command when we are ready so what we need to do at this point is store our next page in a new link and we'll just call this our final link. So we'll just call it F link. And we will save this into a list. And then we're going to append our new URL, remembering what this one right here is going to look like because it's going and looping through a second time of this links. And it's making our new URL that we want to test, which is going to be this one right here. And we will tell this to append so we're going to do f link dot append and we want to append the next page and we're going to want it to append to the next page right here so as we have this next page it if we print this it's going i'll show you what it looks like so if we print this we can say print and then we're going to print the f link and we'll just go ahead and pull this back here and we will run this and it'll show us what our new URL looks like. I accidentally left this slash. That's okay. The browser would have just deleted this second slash. So now if we run it again, it's going to spit out for us this new link. And if you copy this link or just click on it, it will take you, we'll just click on it, it'll take you to this page. And so that is how far we have gotten. So now we have moved with Selenium from this page to the next page and where we're headed is inside this main.py and then we're going to go into the raw and then we want to know if in any of this there is a password or some kind of keyword and so I'll just show you if we type in command find and we type in pass we'll see this password admin we're going to make our program go through all of these words and all these lines inside this text and pull down the password for us so that's where we're headed but right now we got a few pages more we need to move we are right now on this landing page right here so we'll make we'll try and figure out how to make it open this page and then go into the raw and then search for the password so we'll keep going in the next section. Okay, it is time to call our first function. So we can go ahead and comment out this print statement right here and we can call our first function. And we're gonna call it above our for loops because we need our function to be called above where, the function needs to be located above where we call the function. So we will call this function, We'll just call it a loop because we're going to loop through all the links. So we will call it like this. We'll say loop and then we're going to pass in the next page because that's what we want to go searching through in this function. So this is red because we haven't declared our function and we'll declare it up above and we will say def 
and we'll call it our loop and then we're going to pass in a function we'll actually just call it our next page so that way we understand what's happening next page and we have to add in our two dots there and now what do we want to do now that we can get to the next page now there's a couple of things we need to do the first thing is we need to open that new page so we're going to type in driver dot get and then we want it to open that next page so let's see what happens we can come right here we'll just not run the time function and have it sleep and see what happens so we'll run this and see if it opens the page and we can see it or it goes too quick it went too quick so we'll stop right here and we'll say time dot sleep and we'll sleep for two seconds that way we can see if it actually opens the next page and it opens the next page and then it quits so now that we know we're able to get to the next page we need to be able to open this file right here and get to this raw button so in order to do that what I think would be best is to inspect this link and see if we can find what these links what specific we'll see what specific class these links all have in common so that way we can run selenium to pull all the links that would hold every single file within this repository so we can inspect this and it will tell us this is the line and so we'll just go ahead and click this first class and see if it works so we'll just copy this and now we'll need a new resource so we'll call this we'll just call it resource 2 because I'm terrible at naming variables and if I had more time to think about it I would probably come up with something better but you can name it whatever makes sense to you so if I made this tool and somebody else just saw it online they wouldn't be able to understand what's going on because I suck at naming variables but you can name your variables better than me and so we're gonna I'm gonna let you name your own variables but I'm gonna name mine resource 2 because I suck at naming variables so we're gonna go driver dot and we're gonna do a find elements just like this one and then we're gonna say by class name this should be getting familiar to you by now and then the class name is the one we just copied if this works it should be able to print for us that it should be able to print for us this class right here we'll see we can actually get it to print main.py so what we'll do is we'll print and then we'll print the resource to dot text okay apparently we don't need dot text we'll just print resource 2 and see what happens and that has run and it does need resource 2 dot text and the reason that this is not working is because we need it to loop through this links this resource that could be holding multiple this variable that could be holding multiple links within it so like we did down here we will need to go for and we can call this i if we want but i'm going to change it so that way you don't get confused by all these different variables in our for loops we'll call it for a in resource two and then we're going to print resource two dot text we're going to and we're going to print instead of resource 2.txt we're going to print a.txt so that way we can make sure it is printing for us the main.py so that way we can tell it to click on main.py so we can and now what we're going to do is we're going to do a comparison inside of an if statement we're going to comment this out and instead of getting this little error right here we're going to type in pass so that way it will ignore the error for us and we're going to say if the letters together is pi are in a dot text then we want to do something we're going to say print it worked pi is in the text so now if we run this right here oh I see an error we're going to get a problem it says it worked right here but the reason this right we get this right here is it says this is a local variable inside of this segment so this is really not good practice if you were working for a company as a programmer you wouldn't do this but we're not looking to work in a company as programmers we're looking to use programming for hacking and so what we're going to do is we're going to make this a global variable 
we're going to say a is now a global variable and can be accessed anywhere and it gets rid of this for us the reason you wouldn't want to make this global let's say we made this this for loop with the i and we said it's a global now this i variable everywhere we used it is going to be everywhere in our code so we cannot use the variable a anywhere else outside of this because we have made it a global variable and that is really not good programming practice but for the sake of our tool it doesn't really matter so we're going to use it we'll run this and it should work for us and it says it worked pi is in the text what we'll do is we can do the same thing we did before and we can click on this main.py and look at our url so that the way we know how to structure it and then after this time, I promise we'll use the click function or the click method actually, and it'll make it much easier for us. So the way we would go about this, we'll delete this is gonna be similar. If you want, you can try and do something like this and get the next page based off of this URL that we see right here. So if you wanna take this challenge, you can go ahead and do this now and for everyone else i'll walk you through it now we'll call this uh we'll just call it second page because i'm so good at naming variables and then we're going to make this an f string just like we did down here and we're going to add all this together to get the, that new url so we're going to go ahead and we're going to say repo and let's see what did we name this one down here we named it we'll just call it repo because we have the repo up here We'll just copy this. Actually, we'll just leave this. So we'll just use the repo how it is. And then we'll just add in this right here. And we can copy that and paste it in. And then we'll add our slash for the new page that we're going to want to go to. And we'll add this variable in right here, a.text. So we'll say a.text. And now if we print second page, we should get a URL printed that looks exactly like this. And the reason we did it this way is because we're gonna be looping through in this for loop all of the links. And we need these links right here. So if there was, let's say we had a main.py and then we had a CSS, a main.css and then we had a index.js and then we had index.html or we had file.php and there's a whole bunch of files inside this program we would want to loop through all of these files for us so what we're going to do is set it up this way so you can add to it so as an example would be like if js was in a.txt, then it would do the JS instead of pi for us. So that's actually a challenge for you. I'll show you how to add those on and then I'll let you complete the tool as you see fit. So what we're gonna do for now is we're just gonna print this second page and it's gonna open it and it's gonna tell us right here. And we can even add in a time.sleep so that way you can see that it has worked. So it did print for us right here, okay. So I just noticed if you click this page, it takes us to a page not found. And when you compare the two URLs, we're missing this repository right here. So what we will need to do is add in an extra repository. And let's actually see if we can just grab this next page right here. So we're looping through what would be considered the next page. Where's our links at? Okay, so we'll see if we can loop through the next page right here. So we'll add in, instead of repo, we need it to have that repository on it. So we can say next page, which is getting passed through our function. And now let's print it and see if this works for us. It's paused and we have the repository. And if we click on it, it brings us to the next page that we want. And if we were gonna add on to this program, let's say like I was showing you, if there's a JS inside the file, so like if this is a JavaScript file instead of Python, or maybe we wanna check for JavaScript and Python, and maybe later we wanna add PHP, we can do that. And so we can say a.text, and then we can say right here, we need to close this off, and then we could say this exact same thing, and then we would print whatever it is that we wanna test for, so we would say, we're going to go to a new page. If a JavaScript is found, then we're going to do this. And then we can add, turn, we would turn this into an elif. 
and it would say, okay, there's no JavaScript file. So because there's no JavaScript file, we're going to check for a Python file. And so we'll go ahead and run this, make sure we have no errors, and it's going to pass this JavaScript file, and it's going to go straight into the Python file for us. So we run this, and it passes this right here, and then it closes, and it pulls down the main.py. So what you would do if you wanted to make this a comprehensive tool, you would say if there's PHP, if there's JavaScript, if there's JSON, and any other kind of file that you might want to check for sensitive data. But because the repo we're working with to build this tool doesn't have any of that, I'm going to just leave it with Python, and I'm going to challenge you to make the if statements and the elif statements and the else statements all on your own and maybe you can go look at repos and see what you want the program to open up to look for passwords. Now that we know that works we're going to comment out this sleep function because we don't need it. We also don't need it to print the second page. What we're going to do now is we're going to call a second function inside of this function. So it's kind of getting like uh, the movie Inception. We have a function that we're calling inside of another function but we're going to do this one in a much easier method so we're going to go ahead and we're going to call this one function is going to be called going for raw and i'll show you why i'm naming it that going for raw this is going to be the best variable name i have ever come up with and then we're going to pass in the second page and then we'll make the function up here and we'll call it def and we're going to call it going for raw We'll call the function, we're gonna pass in second page. This is actually gonna be the third page. We might actually change this inside here, this parameter in just a second. So what we are going to be doing is going for the raw. So now that we are able to get to this page, we wanna click this button so that way we can get to this page. So in order to click this button, it is gonna be so much easier than what we've been doing as we've been editing this right here, the URL and adding to it. What we're gonna do is just click the button so we can inspect this right here and see, where is it? We'll inspect, see if it can pull it up for me. Okay, now that we have inspected it and you can see when we hover over this right here, we can see this raw button. So now what we need to do is the same thing we've been doing and we need to find a class and see if we can find a class that is used only with that button and get it to open up this raw so that way we land on this page right here. We're just gonna copy that class name that I just showed you right here and see if that can open up this tab for us. So now under this function, what we're going to do is we're just going to say, we're going to type in raw equals, and then we're going to say driver dot find elements. Actually, this time instead of elements plural, we're going to do just one element and we're going to say by dot class name, just like we have been and then we will type in, we'll paste in our link right here. And now what we're gonna do is something really simple. We're just gonna say raw.click. And it's gonna click that button for us. And then what we'll do is we'll come over here, we'll click this. Okay, now that we're able to get to this page, we're gonna tell it that we want the page source. We're gonna want it to right click and say view page source, and then we're going to grab all of this inside of an F string and then see if we can find a password in it. And what that's gonna look like is something like this. We want the HTML, HTML, and we're gonna say driver dot page source. That way it grabs the page source for us like we I just showed you as the same as right clicking it and view page source. We want it to grab that and then we're going to put this into an F string and we're just going to change the HTML. We'll just use that same variable and we'll say HTML is going to be equal to this HTML inside of an F string because we want it to be converted into a string. So we'll say HTML. So now we have this in a string and just to check it, we can say and just to check this, we can say print, and then we want to print HTML. And now when we run this, it's gonna print all of that page source for us into our console, and we want to make sure that it is in a string. Did I, we have an error. Let's see if we, let's see if we can find 
the error here. We need to use driver.get and then we need to get the second page right here. So now if we run this, it should work and it clicked the button and it printed all of this for us and let's see if it printed. Here we have the tags for us and now that we have this printed and it's printed inside of the HTML so we know we grabbed the entire page. We can close out of this. We don't need this print statement. What we're going to do now is really similar to what we did down here. We're going to say if the password is in HTML we want it to print found password. So we'll say print found password and now we can run this and if it finds the word password inside of the HTML it's going to print found password and if we wanted to we can turn this into an F string and it, we can get it to print for us the actual URL where the password was found and we can say something like this we'll make this an F string and say we want to print second page so it'll say found the password and it'll print the page for us and we could click on this second page and go to it. We're getting this error here because we need to put this inside of our string. So if we print this, now it'll tell us it found the password and it'll give us the page to go to right here to check and see what is the context of this password. Now to finish off our tool so that way we can scrape any page on GitHub that we want remembering that we have to get to the page like this. We can go ahead and copy this and we're gonna make an input and we're gonna name our input uh, scrape, scrape just like this and we will say equals and we're gonna make this an input and we're gonna say what page would, would you like to scrape just like this question mark space and now this scrape we're going to pass into our driver.get right here so we will to pass in scrape we're going to, have to make this an f string and we'll say scrape and then we'll highlight it and put it inside curly braces and now when we run this it should ask us for an input what page would you like to scrape and then we put in our page making sure we remember the HTTPS and now when we run this it should run the page for us and now you can run it against other repos and it is a complete tool for you. If you have any suggestions on a tool that you think we should build next that shouldn't be too difficult for us as we are just learning Python, please let me know down in the comments and if you have made it this far in the video, please like and subscribe.